uh, did some training at Harvard University in negotiation and leadership, and uh, am certified by the um, Camp Institute in Walnut Creek. They actually certify people who are trainers for expert professional negotiators. And so I've trained about, about more than 8,000 people uh, in different countries, in Latin America and the United States and in Europe. Uh, you, you start out with negotiating with your parents. And uh, I always knew that I asked my dad for money. If I didn't get any money, I always knew my mom was a softer touch. So it would have been easier to get money from my mother. So we, we negotiate. We negotiate um, all the time. We do it um, and we learn certain skills. We learn them uh, a lot of times. We learn them from our parents or our role models or teachers. Uh, sometimes we learn negotiation as a matter of survival. You know, uh, am I going to, the fire's there and there's a river here. Do I swim the river or do I go through the fire? Uh, sometimes it's a life and death issue. Um, and as uh, uh, we were talking about earlier, in hostage negotiation, it is a life and death issue. And the same is true, because I'm a hospital administrator and physician, and uh, people decide, do I want to do chemotherapy? Um, and then, you know, the experience of chemotherapy is, is um, very strenuous. You know, you're sitting there for five hours uh, every day, five days a week, or three weeks, you know, with an injection, just sitting there quietly. It's very painful, you lose your hair. Um, do you want to do that, or you do you want to just say, oh, okay, I'll just let the cancer do whatever it's going to do? So we negotiate. We negotiate with our doctors um, about, you know, cosmetic surgery. And we, we talk about the word negotiation. So first, first of all, I'm going to uh, teach you a, a concept that's really important in negotiation. And that's the word N-O, no. A lot of people, and I don't know about China or other countries, but I know in the United States, you know, has a horrible reputation. You ask a girl to dance, no. You go, oh, I feel horrible, right? Um, you apply for a job, and they say, no, you're not, you're not good enough, or somebody is better. So we all have this emotional connection with the word no. Well, the negotiation, no, is just a choice. And actually, it's a good choice. And one of the books, um, one of the, um, Founders of the Camp Institute, as I mentioned earlier, um, who was um, still uh, working with the FBI, um, he wrote a book, Start With No. Uh, because if you, if I'm selling my car, let's say $10,000, and I sell it to him, and he says, yes, there's no negotiation, so if he says no, then the negotiation is fine, okay? One of, the, one of the most important things that people don't do when they negotiate is they have no plan. They go in, okay, we're here to negotiate. What's your plan? Plan? Do you still have a plan? Yes, you must have a plan. So my son, uh, when he graduated from college, he went to Brown University, graduated, and he's um, interviewing for his first job. He said, Dad, I got the job. They asked me how much money I want. And they said, why don't you go think about it and come back? And so he called the dad. What do I tell them? What do I tell them? If I tell them too much money, uh, they'll reject me. If I say too little, they think you're not qualified. It'll take me a long time to catch up. So what do you think you should do in a situation like that? You need to be educated. So I told my son, you go to three websites, salary.com, there's a, several of them. And you look and you put in your education your years of experience, the location of the job, and you look for salary service, and you compare. So he was going to ask $58,000. Man, that's quite low. So he went, did the salary surveys, went through three of them, and they all about $74,500 was about. So he went into the negotiation, and uh, this is what he said. He said, um, I'm asking for $74,500, and they said, okay. There was no negotiation. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Because he was prepared and he knew what he was worth. Oftentimes we go to negotiation, we don't know what we're worth. And so we often get undersold. Now, at Harvard University, I, I don't like the, the system that they use because they have, I'm sure all of you heard the term, 
uh, win-win situation, right? That's garbage. Because when someone says win-win, that means they're going to have the advantage over you because they want you to lower your to come to where they are. So you're really losing. So I, my, my advice to you is, uh, and, and Harvard now is changing. They're actually using the Camp Institute. Actually, uh, Jim Camp is the one that developed the, the, the system. He actually went there um, four years ago to Harvard University, did a presentation to them. And then he went back, his son, who actually uh, also in camp, obviously, uh, went the next year and did presentation. And now they're actually incorporating and using those techniques in Harvard. And I think that they're playing down the idea of a win-win situation. What's bad about some of the concepts about the Harvard negotiation is that, for example, if I'm selling my car for $10,000, I better know if it's worth it or not, right? Um, so I need to do, you know, go online, there's the bluebook.com, there's a whole bunch of other websites, I'm sure you see some of the advertisements for them, um, to make sure you know exactly what the car is worth. Um, in, at Harvard, they have what they call um, um, the best alternative to your negotiation. Um, it's called BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, best alternative to uh, negotiated agreement. So if I talk to him and I say, uh, I'm selling you my car for $10,000, and he said $9,000. So now if I go to her, my best alternative, if she, if she doesn't give me more than $9,000, then I already have this $9,000, right? Set up. So that's the Harvard approach. What's the problem with that? She said, I said, okay, $9,000. She said, no, $8,500. Okay. Oh, okay. she's been a negotiator. Right? So I go back to him and he said, oh, I have bought another car. So what happens is it's not, it's not reliable. Also, what if I don't have any comparison? What if I don't have another one? I don't have a bad guy. So I don't really know what, what, it, what I can sell it for. So how do you get one? Do I play games with him and, and get what his bid is so I'm really negotiating with this person? Again, going back to the internet, and sometimes it's very difficult on the internet to really get a value of something, like a new idea. My father was an inventor. Uh, he invented the solar cooker. He actually sold it to Boy Scouts. You know, it's a little fold-up uh, aluminum thing. It opens like this. You put a tray in there, light a fire, and it actually cooks your food. And it's a little handheld. It's made out of aluminum. He sold it for $13,000 to Boy Scouts. He, he talked to a lawyer much later. They said, you know, you, probably, you could have gotten $150,000 mm -hmm. for it. My dad said, well, you know, I liked inventing, and I was happy with the $13,000. Well, that's true, yeah. But there's another book on negotiation called How Much Money Did You Leave on the Table? So my father left a lot of money because he, to him, $13,000, well, this is a long time ago, right, uh, was a lot of money. And so, I mean, you could buy half a house for that, that price. And I was born in Sunnydale, um, and uh, uh, that's where we live. So negotiation, again, you have to do your homework, a lot of preparation. We talked about emotional aspects of negotiation. Keep your emotions out of it. Um, I um, have a good friend who sells Lexus cups. And, uh, he, he go to concerts and, and stuff. And so I, I was going to buy a new car. And he said, I have a used Lexus. Um, actually, we were at, the, we were at the, the concert. And I was sitting next to him during the break. And we were talking. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I see you have a Lexus pin. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to buy one. And, and so he said, how much is it? And he looked up. He knew by the code exactly everything about that car. You know, he had it accessible. And he says, I have one that's a year newer. And it's a higher uh, quality. It's called a crown edition. So this is what this guy did. So, he, so I drive all the way over to um, San Francisco. And the first thing he does is he gives me the key to the car. And he says, take it for a ride. And he goes with me. And he said, now, now turn on the corner. And he turns really sharp. He's showing me all these great things. I fell in love with the car. 
Mm-hmm. It was an emotion, right? <laughs> yeah. Never let your emotions enter into your negotiation. I probably could have knocked off at least five or ten thousand dollars off of the price of the car. Um, but he is, you know, for twenty years he sells cars, and he tells me the whole history of the Lexus in Japan. How we spent ten years developing it, all of the bells and whistles, and how to use them. You know, it's kind of like. Um, um, so, so anyway, so, so you get the idea about emotion. So a lot of people are um, jaded. Um, they are influenced by um, the, their emotional uh, appeal for, uh, there's a joke about men and women, so it, I'm not a gender specific person, but uh, so <laughs> it, the joke goes like this. Um, a man goes to a store to buy something and he pays whatever the price is because that's what he needs. A woman goes to the store and, and buys something that's on sale even if she doesn't need it. Okay, so there, so the the man in that, and you know this is stereotype, and I, I apologize for doing that, but it's putting out something that the man is not using emotions, but the woman is in making the decision, and so which is right. Well, it's just a different style of negotiation. But if you're a serious negotiation, uh, a person, you need to do your homework, and you need to prepare, and you need to have an agenda in your negotiations. Um, um, most of you uh, <laughs> have gone through the process of negotiating jobs and, and positions. And that's the, probably the most important because the level that you start your first job puts you at a certain income level. So if you negotiate too low, it takes the rest of your life, you're always going to be in the lower end of that, that percentile. So that first, that's why my son was really important, you know, really important to him to understand. And so <clears throat> now he makes $21,000 a month, you know, uh, simply because he started and he knew what his value was. He would probably be making maybe twelve dollars or $14,000 a month now if he would have uh, said, oh, that 58000 I think that's good, uh, uh, you know, salary to start out with. And so then... They accepted it, so then they asked him, well, you know, and then they negotiated all the terms. So the, um, the retirement benefits and, and, and stock options, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of those, you got to do your homework. They asked you to compare <coughs> even health programs, you know, health care, insurance. Which one do you choose? You got to do your homework based on what's best for you. That insurance may be good for somebody, you know, A insurance may be good for one person, but not you, maybe B has a better option for you. Okay, so I kind of jump in here. So let's uh, take a look at some slides that I uh, put together. Um, another joke, I think humor is very important. It's healthy. Uh, people that um, have a good humor live longer. Positive people live nine years longer than negative people. <laughs> negative people have four times as much cancer. Five times as many heart attacks. They have less friends because who wants to be around a negative person? So being positive, keep that in mind. It's very important for your health. So Bill Gates um, has um, is it two or three dollars. He's got three fifths. Anyway, it's that thought. So uh, this man comes up to his daughter and he says, no, I mean to her, his son, and he says. I want you to marry, I, I want to choose the person that you marry. No, I want to choose. He says, I want you to marry Bill Gates' daughter. He says, oh, okay. ah, in that case, okay. So the father calls up the president of the Bank of America and says, I want you to appoint my son as pre vice president of the bank. Isn't that crazy? He said, uh, he's uh, Bill Gates' son. <laughs> He's, he's, he's the future son of law. Oh, and that keeps okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he calls up Bill Gates and says, I want my son to marry your daughter. He's the, the vice president of Bank of America. <laughs> 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 Negotiation, right? So you always negotiate from a position of strength. So what is strength? 
Now, strength to me may be different than him or her, right? So, if, if, in, for example, selling my car, right? So if I drive a lot, the comfort of the seats is going to be really important, or the gas mileage will be really important. Um, so, again, when you're negotiating, you have to you have to determine what are the most important things in that negotiation process. They may not be as important to the other person, just like my son negotiating for his position as an information architect. He he had certain skills, so he won. And, and, and um, let me back up just a second. When you're negotiating, again, we talked about emotion. Take the emotion out of it because it will, it will ruin the negotiation. And it takes practice to not get emotional. And the other side, if they're good negotiated, they'll try to get you emotion. Just like my friend who sold me the Lexus, right? Uh, uh, handed me the key, right? And then, you know, and of course you fall in love with the car because it's a, you know, I don't know how many driven in Lexus. Now I fall in love with Tesla. So my next question is Tesla. Um, so I was talking about emotions and awesome strengths. What I'm saying is that um, something may be important to you, but it may not be important to the other person. And so these are items that you need to prepare ahead of time. Basically, what's negotiable? Um, when I graduated from medical school, um, you know, if you want to buy a house, even if you have graduated from medical school, you can't buy a house. You have to have two years of work experience. I was offered a job working at Stanford, but I had no experience working as you know, assistant director of the hospital. So, um, I had a real estate agent and I explained the situation to her. I said, I have the two years of experience. <coughs> so she, she taught me the process because she'd been a real estate agent for quite a while. She's a very successful one. And so she told me what to do. And so I went to the bank and they opened a special loan because I had credit before and worked before I went to medical school. So they said that, um, and, and, and I graduated. Um, from medical school, and, and so they said that you can borrow $93,000, that we will loan you $93,000 to my house. So Keely, my realtor, um, we went around looking at houses, and uh, my wife and I uh, went to we found this one we love in Foster City. It was $126,000. Now we could borrow $93,000. So Keely said, I've done a homework for you. This man has been transferred by his company to Los Angeles. So he put a down payment. He had to take out a loan for a down payment. He has to take out a mortgage. That's the second payment. He's still paying the mortgage on the house in Foster City. And he's anxious to get out of that other uh, <coughs> obligation that he had. So I went to the guy and with my realtor. And I said, look, I, I don't want to insult you. I went to the bank. I can borrow $93,000. I can't negotiate. That's it. That's all the money that I have uh, available for that. So I'll take it. Why did he take it? Because financially constrained, every cent he was making he was paid in the down payment, in the mortgage, and in uh, continuing to pay on the house um, in Foster City. So looking, so having a realtor that does their homework and knows the story behind the house and why it's for sale. Again, a negotiation, again, it's about preparation. It's about knowing ahead of time um, your strength. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, as you learn to hold back your emotions in negotiation, this is um, one way to do that. If I'm talking, I'm attached to my emotions, right? If I'm asking you a question, you're answering, so I have no emotion because when I ask you a question, it's not an emotional aspect. So the more questions I ask the other person, the more information I'm getting. Remember that in a negotiation, you want as much information about uh, from that other person. You want to know what's important to them, what's the value, why are they selling it, or what are they doing, or, or what, what's the entitled, and the, the, what's in, incorporated into the position that you're applying for. 
Um, and it's called creating vision. And there's four visions you want to create in negotiation, whatever negotiation is. Even a telephone call. Before you make a telephone call, you should have a list of all your questions that you're going to ask. I know some people, are, they hang up after, oh, I forgot to ask this, I forgot to ask that. It's really bad in negotiation. You want to have, we call it a agenda, an agenda or a, 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 a list of things that you wanted to discuss. And how they answer those questions you want to evaluate in order to determine um, your position. So you have an agenda, you, the four visions. First is my vision of what's their problem. Why are they selling it? Why is that position open? Did somebody get fired? Did they create a new position? Did somebody get promoted? All of these are relevant to that position. You want to know about that position, what, what they do, what, how do your features and characteristics, your abilities match with that? Your, what are your strengths? And again, knowing your strength. So when you negotiate, so that my, my son was um, um, negotiating for this position with um, a company, uh, you've heard of Marriott Hotel. Yeah. So there were, he was part of a team of 20 that redesigned all of the uh, Marriott Hotel website and made them more user friendly. So the fact that my wife, his mother, is a, 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 an executive travel agent and that he's, you know, he visited lots of hotels and stuff, you know, that, that helps because he's had that experience of visiting them, of going on, um, making reservations, helping, you know, his mom, um, you know, how parents talk their kids into working and doing some of that stuff. Sure, familiar with it. Um, so, uh, so he, so he's negotiating. He knows about the position. He knows that it's designing these websites, and so he's looking for all the strengths that he has. And so he actually took with him a portfolio of things that he did in the university, uh, examples of things that most apply to that position. Again, this is all that planning I talked. Negotiation takes a lot of planning if you do it correctly. It takes a lot of training in order to withhold your emotion. So let's get back to emotion. When you're in the negotiation, you want to ask questions, you want to create a vision. What's their problem? They're filling that position in, in the company. Why are they filling the position? The more you know about it, the more, <clears throat> um, the more you can create a vision in their mind, that's the second thing. Right? First is your vision of their problem or their need. The second vision is how can I fill that need? Third vision is to convince them, create a vision in their mind that I'm the best person to fill that position. So the first is getting as much information so we ask lots of questions. So what kind of questions do you ask in negotiation? You don't ask um, yes and no questions. Why it doesn't give you much information, um, and it cuts off the communication. You want that person to talk as much. When we're dealing with the gorillas who, um, you know, in the jungle, who have no educational level at all, they've been fighting for 50 years, living in the jungle, raising their kids. They're like grandparents, you know, they're living in the jungle. Um, so I, again, it's uh, looking and creating a vision in their mind of what's the benefit to them for accepting a negotiated agreement with them. Uh, so asking questions. Keep them talking so you can learn about their vision. If you talk, you're not learning anything. This is was said by a lot of famous people. Uh, and you're boring the other person. Because when you talk about yourself, um, they're not interested. They're interested in what you can do for their company. How are you of value to them? You don't go in and say, oh, I want the job. I need a job. And, oh, I, you know, I want to make money. And uh, they don't care about that. They have nothing to do it. They care about what can you do to improve, to make the company better. So when I interview uh, to run hospitals, for example, I was the administrator of the county hospital in San Mateo. They, uh, they hired me. I worked uh, for National Medical Enterprise on the uh, American Stock Exchange. We got a contract with the county of San Mateo to run the county hospital. 
the hospital was losing $18 million a year. So where does that money come from? From some of the tax people over the time. So they hired us, and so we had a two-year contract to turn around the budget so that instead of losing $18 million a year, that we're actually at least breaking even, if not making a profit. So it took us, uh, so we showed them you know, our experience in other hospitals and what we had done. And two years later, of course, we were able to take the budget out of the red and put it into the black. Um, and then it's convincing them of a plan. So I evaluated the budget and looked at it, and I could see, I could see three million dollars just worth of wasted money. Uh, the administrator of the hospital, for example, had eight cars from the carpool charged to his office, and he used his own car. He wasn't even using it. They had a high-pressure steam boiler uh, that cost him a million dollars a year to run because you have to have a stationary engineer. 24 hours a week, seven days a week, watching those high pressure steam boilers. I shut down the steam boilers, got rid of the, uh, and you have to have full time employment, 20, 24 7, right? You gotta have an, a person there so that boiler doesn't blow up, right? So I got rid of all the, the them and the high pressure steam, and I converted over in, in surgery, we used disposable or reusable, uh, re, uh, disposable uh, things. And like the cafeteria, we actually, did a lot of you know, you know the people that we um, sent the hospital in San Francisco by the airport. We actually signed a contract with the people that provide food for the, the airplanes. And, you know they have to provide special meals as well. So it was great for the hospital because they knew exactly. And so we actually cut out about uh, uh, fifty-five percent of our budget just boom like that. So again, it's it's. Um, Looking at the situation and see how you can be a value of what expertise you have and looking for key things. Did you guys, um, any of you that are in accounting know that you look at the budgets and you have to have kind of a, an idea of ratios. Um, and that's how you analyze. You're going to buy a company. You need to know what you want to. Um, so getting back to, to, to salary negotiation again, you need to know what you're worth <coughs> in that mark again. Um, an information architect like my son in San Francisco is paid much uh, different from a person in Iowa or a person in Miami or a person in Austin, Texas. So a location, location, location. So the Fijian for is the creating a salary, like the, the last one. Yeah, what's yeah. the number four? Yeah, so the first one is... My Fijian of okay, the one. Okay, the first one is I have a vision of your problem. Second is, you see your problem. Sometimes they think it's a different problem. You go to the doctor and say, oh, I have this, you know, I, 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 a rash, I need a medicine. The doctor says, no, you don't, you don't have a rash, uh, you have an immune disease, right? Mm -hmm. So again, the first is, uh, what does that person think? The patient, for example, we negotiate with patients all the time. Um, what does the patient think? And then we have to create a vision in the mind of the patient of what the real problem is. And then the third vision is my vision of how we can help the person. And then the person has to see how that will help them. So they make the decision to follow that, that advice. And they're welcome to get a second opinion. And I think it's very important nowadays that people do get second opinions. So very, very helpful. Um, in, in <clears throat> because you actually get new perspective. Uh, when you get a second opinion, um, maybe they have different equipment, maybe they use different medication, maybe they have uh, the, the doctor that you're negotiating with has a different training in a specialty. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, between two people, not two, uh, two organizations. Oh, well, uh, the example I just gave, National Medical Enterprise, we were negotiating with the um, county manager of uh, San Mateo. Right. So and he had... So, to see the vision that you had that would improve your situation. Oh, it started out, we were reading the newspaper about all the problems about the hospital. Right. And we did our background research. And we're looking at and we're seeing people have to wait too long to get the doctor. Uh, the, the, the hospital wasn't charging for prescriptions correctly and losing money. 
So we did our research, even in the New York Times, there was an article about that, that hospital. So we did a research ahead of time. So when we approached the county manager, we said, you know, we, we are consultants, we work with problem hospitals, and we're kind of up to speak. And we, you know, do this research. and we see that these are the problems that we have, and these are some of the ideas we have. Uh, so give us a chance, give us a two year contract to turn it around. And so, um, he was a, a, a new county manager, and he had an assistant that really liked our idea. Did you see the money, the, the moving money ball? Yeah, pay attention to it. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But that's the idea, is, is using, uh, calculating what's more beneficial. If, if you have a chance, if you want to learn more about negotiation, read the book, Money Ball. And the guy, um, he lives up in Piedmont. He's written quite a few books about uh, negotiation. Again, it goes back to that emotional component. A lot of these people are real. So you're asking the question about two weeks. So National Medical Enterprise, the county of San Diego, um, negotiating. So <clears throat> we are creating in our own mind what the problem is and how we can help solve the problem. So when we talk to the county manager, it is getting a better idea. This is what we think the problem's like. And then we ask lots of questions. Then we keep on talking. And they're telling all oh, about well, this and this, and this is really a high priority, and this is uh, more important, and this, 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 this. Okay, all right, so we got the vision. Okay, now this is how we can help you. Now, convincing them by explaining. We don't convince people, we influence people by giving them facts. Um, in negotiation, you're always as honest as you possibly can be. Um, one person asked me once, uh, uh, that was in, in a course, uh, it's a 40 hour course to be certified. And um, he asked me, well, what if the other people take the course too? I said, it's better because we actually have a better negotiation because it's a really honest negotiation that you have. Okay, so did I answer your question? Yeah. Is, is, uh, again, uh, doing your homework ahead of time, like I mentioned, that's really important for negotiation. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second is, just like your kids negotiating for uh, a new device. Um, the guy that wrote the book, his daughter, is like, that one girl, yeah? That's a watch. <laughs> and she talks to her body, it's like Dick Tracy, you know? <laughs> she narrow shaved with her dad because all of her friends <laughs> in school had one of those watches. And he's seven years old. It's not an Apple watch, I'm just a All right. Uh, okay, so we talked about your strengths, um, negotiation strengths. Uh, And again, uh, practicing skills, as I mentioned, that are important. Again, getting your emotion out. How do you do that? Again, asking questions. And you ask, uh, you don't ask yes and no questions. We'll talk about uh, the type of questions that you ask. Um, so I'm getting a little ahead of where the slides are, but that's okay. So let's talk about a definition of negotiation. This is really important. What what is negotiation? If I ask, usually I ask people to write down uh, what it is. And one interesting thing that comes out of it is that if you look at a dictionary, there's a little extra added to the word negotiation. People say, well, it's just two people coming together and agreeing on a price of something or value of something, right? But the part that people don't pay attention to in addition, a dictionary like in Oxford, is that each person has the right to say no, to walk away. You always have to keep that in your mind. That the other person can walk away at any time, and you can walk away at any time. Now, if you can't walk away, then you are showing neediness. It's like begging, right? Asking for alms. You can't do that. Again, we Coming back to emotion, you're showing emotion, needy. You never should show neediness in negotiation. Like you're desperate, or I have to, or we, uh, you know, coming up with timelines, or uh, you got to make a decision. And you know, you see these things on the website, right? This coupon's only good sixty percent off, but only twenty four hours to use, right? Um, okay. Um, 
negotiation concept. Uh, okay. So, so basically, negotiate is just an interaction with two people, but each party has the ability to say no. That's really important. And remember what I said in the very beginning, that no is just a word, right? It's not a rejection. Um, we are programmed in our society in the United States, and I'm sure other countries as well, we, people don't like to be rejected. And so we take it personally. Again, take your emotions out of the situation. Okay, uh, and, and um, I'm not going to go through it. Um, um, so negotiation is similar to diplomacy. You should follow certain standards, not insulting people. Uh, the most important thing you can do in negotiation is listen. Ask really good questions and then listen to the answers. When I first got my master's degree in hospital administration, I got my first job, and let me tell you how I chose that job. I chose to work in this hospital in Modesto, it's called Memorial Hospital, for Cliff Linda, because he had 25 years experience, and he was the president of the California Hospital Association. I learned more from him in one year than I wanted to learn maybe in 10 years from, you know, you know from any other position. And, what, uh, and so many things I learned from him. Um, I actually had an opportunity to meet with the Joe, uh, Joe Onegan and Sue Eisenstadt uh, with the Carter administration on the National Council. Um, so what he taught me was, we went, um, in, in Modesto, if you want to add beds to the hospital, to expand your hospital, you have to get permission and you have to show there's a need for those types of beds. So if you want to put in a heart surgery, you have to show that it's a long distance to go to heart surgery, uh, and that there's a high demand, and there's a high incidence of it, and um, it will help the community. And you have to prove how many beds would So the company, National Medical Enterprise, who I wasn't working for at that time, um, they applied to the state to add 100 beds in Modesto, 100 hospital beds. And they spent over $10 million to prove that they needed to add 10 beds. So I'm sitting there with the administrator of the hospital, uh, the guy that was the former president of the company, hospital association. And he said, Lee, I want you to ask one question. So, okay. Said, now these beds, all these beds are the parents already went to the park. That's the question I asked. So I'm a little student, you know, and they asked a little weak question, and I said, yes, on the record, right? That night, he said, Lee, I want you to start writing a program, and, and I want you to show that we had developed programs to get permission to build those hundred beds in our hospital. So they spent $10 million to get permission to add 100 beds. In the end, we got 43 of those beds. Only by asking the question, because we proved that they needed an oncology unit um, there. And so we actually designed the oncology unit. We put in radiation therapy, which a lot of people had to go two hours each day to Stanford to get radiation treatment, come back next day, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and, and we also showed that the incidence was actually higher in cancer in Modesto because a lot of people, it's hotter there, and there's more sun, and more people were out, outdoors, more agri uh, agrarian uh, economy. So, questions are important. Um, sometimes the people, you know, you may ask a question, they don't think it's important, but you know it's important because uh, you have done your research and you know what are key details that you want information about. Again, you want to know what the problem is in the negotiation. Maybe salary is a problem um, for that position. Maybe you will accept less, but you want more vacation time, or you want them to pay for your membership in the in a professional society. That's one of the things my son got on top of it, was going once a year to the convention for information architects, and they paid for them for that. So again, 
uh, you have to know what's of value to you. If you want to continue your education, maybe that's why it was important to my son to have that component. He accepted the 50 percent file, and I, we're talking about uh, the, the, the wage and that in, in the location. Okay. Uh, again, you have to have objectives ahead of time, and the negotiation is to realize those. Um, so. Forethought, as I mentioned before, these are concepts that you need to pay attention to in negotiation. Uh, evaluating the objective carefully and objectively. Not emotionally, but objectively. What are the values of those? And again, if you're negotiating for a salary, um, it's not only the salary, it's the benefits, the working conditions. Um, you know, some people, maybe it's important they have a, a window in their office. Maybe it's important that they have certain kind of equipment to use so they're accessible to you. Um, um, when my first, as I mentioned, in the county hospital in San Mateo, uh, they offered me a car. Well, you know, I had their own car, so I wasn't a ghost. I, don't, I didn't want them to provide a car for me. Um, so that wasn't important, but some other things were important. Um, and um, so one of them was. Uh, they actually paid for me to do a, a training on, uh, because I wanted to do some remodeling in hospital. So in Denver, Colorado, uh, they have a two week seminar for hospital design and building and expansion. And so they paid for me to go to that because they know there's a benefit to them. Uh, key test, uh, credibility again, uh, how strong is your evidence? So again, if we're going back to the salary survey, the three salary surveys, how reliable is that information that you have? Um, if you go around and ask your friends, that's not very reliable information, and it's probably jaded because they're probably going to show you, you, uh, you know, inflate the numbers. Here, you're not inflating the numbers. You're showing them exactly what the facts are as best uh, uh, is available, and also how current the information is, by the way, as well. Um, preparation again. You have to know as much as possible. Again, we did lots of research. Every time I applied for a position or was asked to join um, a hospital, I was uh, the first thing I did was do my homework and find out as much about the hospital. I read the local newspaper. I read the area newspaper, California newspapers, Chronicle, LA Times, uh, about those hospitals, the problems they've had uh, with doctors, with nurses, with unions, all of those things I needed to know because when I went in and negotiated for that position uh, of strength, uh, because if I'm going to ask for a certain amount of money, I need to show uh, that value to them by having me run their hospital. Uh, presentation, this is really important. Uh, a lot of people, when they go negotiate or they're selling a product, um, they do this beautiful PowerPoint presentation. As you know, I'm, I'm kind of ignoring it, but I'm using it as a guy. But a lot of people come in with this PowerPoint presentation. And, and uh, I was the president of a company in Fremont called NCOL. NCOL stands for Enhanced Culture, Someone called a product. And so I won. So I wanted. Uh, so I was the president of the company. I was hired to be president of the company because I'm a physician and, and, and a hospital I had experience. So um, I was only president for six months. I hated the job. I found out what a president does in the company. You go around begging for money for people to invest in your company. And that's <laughs> all I was doing is going around with my cup, you know, asking for people to invest in my company. And, and I'm a doctor and I like the research. I want to do research. So, so I told the board director, I said, look, uh, why don't you hire someone that likes to beg for money, and then why don't you demote me to senior vice president for research, and so then I started doing research at Stanford, and then I fell in love with it, and doing that, which was a lot of fun. Again, I didn't know what president of the company, I was, you know, I was um, flattered that they offered me the position of the president of the company, and until I found out what presidents of companies do. So make sure that if you're applying for a position that you know what you're going to be doing. You know, are you um, are you going to be an administrative assistant or are you going to be somebody that delivers coffee to people? You know, I, I, again, uh, 
One is paying attention to the people that are in the job. Go to the website. Look at the pictures that they, that, of their employees at the, the website. Read about them in the newspaper. What kind of relations? Again, the more you know, the more prepared you are to to make a decision. You through your research, for example, one of the hospitals I didn't want to work for, well, one was in Texas and one was in uh, uh, Sacramento. And the reason is I investigated, and the board of directors was not strong, and they were very biased, and they were doctors. So you know that if I brought in new doctors, they're going to be competing with them. They're not going to like that idea um, uh, of competition. The one in Texas had a lot of other problems. They were, they were, they were competing with another company, and I found out what was going on, and they're expanding the other company. And that hospital was actually better off because the building was so old. The best thing you could do is destroy the building and start all over again, really. And they had more beds in that location than they would need it. So, in, during my background research, I, I you know, determined that it really wasn't worth it. There's nothing I could do there that would be really helpful to that situation. Um, so, again, the job and you know, what exactly does it entail? Um, Okay, so preparation, the, as I said, uh, so if, so, so I'm president of the company, I make this beautiful PowerPoint, right? 35 perfect slides. I go to uh, Piper uh, in Palo Alto on 101 and University. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. To, to have them help me get money for the thing. And I went and did my presentation. And that's where I learned that my presentation was about me. I didn't know what was important to Piper about, because they wanted to, I wanted them to invest in our company. But their motive for investing was very different than what our motives were. They wanted to come in and put in their own members of the board of directors. They wanted to change our product uh, to, instead of a medical product, to more of a beauty product. Um, yeah, and they had all kinds of things. And we just said, hey, and they wanted to take control of the company. Um, you know, they, they did a lot of things. And then the next, and then I did it again. Um, a couple months later in Palo Alto, uh, I did a presentation. But I changed the presentation to meet what the, the venture capital people wanted and, and really made a difference. And they did make an offer. And then the guy that, that started the company that developed the product uh, was afraid that they would steal his idea and, and get, push him out of the company. And so uh, I, I don't know if it was founded or not, but they offered him you know, $40 million, which you know, is a nice amount of money for his idea. Are you still in my company? No, no, oh, no more. I'm I'm still on the board. Uh, uh, I'm a consultant. I, I do work with them. Do you find that when uh, you do you find that you know, you just gave two approaches. Another one is, and what I did is I actually went to the hospital, knowing you know, what the county hospital I actually talked to the employee. And that's what I was. I, I said I was a physician, um, and then I'm looking for a new position, which I was, um, but even though it's running the hospital. And I talked to uh, the woman who's actually the director of nursing. Um, and so I really liked that she would support what I would have been doing. And she had these great ideas to go, yeah, boy, someone asked, no one ever asked me, but I can make a lot of suggestions. I could do this, 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 you know, that's what they should be doing. So right away, I knew it was a real fertile ground. So I, um, one time when I was working uh, on a contract with Yahoo, um, and uh, Wells Fargo, the same, the same thing. Um, again, when you talk to the employees ahead of time, you get an idea about what's really going on with them. It was, uh, that was in 2009 when um, I was hired to go to Wells Fargo in, in, in uh, 
Ebola crater and to terminate 800 employees. It was hard. There was a movie at the time about this guy flies the plane and lays off the and that's that's the only way I felt like. And so I worked for right management as a negotiator with them um, to determine the the um, basically um, like at Yahoo, for example, some of the people who were let go because they were losing jobs, some people were transferred out of the time. So we had to work one on one with those people. And once those people were not needed and were looking for jobs, and we we did something different different we actually prepared them to apply for other positions. It's called uh, outplacement. I mean, I think you're just familiar. So we did lots of outplacement. You know, 2008, 2009. There was a lot of outputs. We did Yahoo, IBM, and Wells Fargo, Google's what we did a lot of different at the time. Um, and it was um, it was really kind of sad what happened because uh, there's one woman, for example, who worked she and her husband were, both worked for Wells Fargo. Um, and so she was 18, he was 18, they graduated from high school, they got a job working at Wells Park. You know, as a teller, they worked their way up. 20 years later, she can make decisions about $2 million purchase on mortgage. He, the same. So they were both making uh, about $120,000 a year. They had a house that they bought. In the morning, 400 people was the wife. In the afternoon was the husband, who found out that he lost. So they both lost their job in the same day. And when I saw his name, I go, oh, man. It was really sad. So they lost their house because they both lost their job. Right? You know, they're both making $120,000 a year, 118 yeah. Um, And in the same day, they both lost their job. So good reason not to marry someone you work with. <laughs> 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 well, it's not a good idea anyhow. Um, being a hospital administrator, I. Um, and I'm sure you hear about the Miki movement as well. It's not good to uh, date people or marry people. It's just, it's, it's, it's not a good idea. I was vacation. I was vacation. What vacation? I was vacation. Oh, diversification. I think there's something about vacation. <laughs> yeah, you need to go on permanent vacation. Also, child vacation. Okay, so again, part of that vision that you're creating is that you're actually showing the benefits to all parties uh, on the team. And again, you're going to have different people looking at different perspectives. Um, in negotiation, for example, you may have an accountant, you may have a marketing person, you may have an HR person, and you may have a member of the group. Right? Again, each one's going to see from a very different perspective. Um, another thing about negotiation is and, and we call it a budget. How much investment is the other side doing in the negotiation? For example, um, when when I was working for National Medical Enterprise and, and we negotiated with with um, San Mateo County, we flew our people from Beverly Hills to San Mateo and met there with them to show how honest we were in the <laughs> that we're engaged in, in doing that. Um, if uh, you're negotiating with people and they want you to come to their office, he didn't want to come to their office. No, he didn't know. We actually made the presentation. And again, the presentation that we did was not our presentation for our men. It was a presentation what the benefits were for them and their hospital. And we actually talked about, uh, I'll give you just one brief example. They had the intensive care unit and the coronary care unit, six beds of each. Yeah. You know what that means? That a man in an accident, yelling and screaming in pain, next to a person who's recovering from a heart attack, who needs quiet. So the first thing I said is, I want to put a wall right down the middle, and I want to put cardiac beds on one side and, and intensive care unit beds on the other side. Um, and that really made a big difference as well because the people recover faster. If you have a heart attack and people are screaming and yelling, or they're, they're a drug addict, they're coming out of a you know, drug with, withdrawal, and a person with a heart attack is trying to recuperate, can't take them longer to recuperate. Um, 
So just little things. Uh, and again, the more homework that you do, the more prepared you are. You have probably have a question. Yeah, like the last story you have is kind of an example of the first thought, the first bullet, right? That yes. You thought about it before. How about like the food test? Uh huh. How, how can you make it for me? Okay, so a key test, uh, I, again, that's like our experience at National Medical Enterprise and working with other hospitals, and this is what we have done, and, and show how we've increased their profit and increase their uh, market share and the prices. Uh, for example, we know that in San Mateo, they weren't capturing all of the charges for drugs. They were losing over a million and a half dollars a year because the nurses and the, the, the people that were giving the meds weren't properly documenting it and then sending a, a ticket out to accounting to charge it. So uh, uh, again, it was, uh, this was our experience that we did with a hospital in Long Beach and we actually were able to capture, and this is what we did, we set up a system of where uh, as soon as a nurse writes, uh, the doctor writes the order, it actually goes through the system. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know if any of you are familiar with SAP. You guys yeah. heard of SAP, right? Yes. Not really. <laughs> it's not intuitive. You push a button and you don't know what's going to jump off where, and you don't know where to click. But one thing nice about SAP is when you put a person's name in once, it's there forever. So that means that um, you don't have to reduplicate all this general information about them. Um, it, it's already there. And so that's what we did with the with the capture system for the accounting. And we found out that the reason, and you know, we had a lazy person that was working in their accounting department that knew about this and could have done something about it. And so um, that was one of the positions that we designed. Um, simply, and the lady was, um, had been there 40 some years. She had worked her way up as an assistant in the personnel department. And it, it was time for her to retire. So we, we had to talk to her to talk about retirement. And we gave her some nice extra uh, retirement benefits. She was actually costing yeah, you know, you know. what she was doing was actually costing the county about two million dollars a year uh, in lost charges and um, holding up the paperwork so that the, the charges weren't coming back. One hospital I did, um, Stanislaus Memorial Hospital. Um, one simple thing that we did, you know, it, it, the uh, outstanding balance of payment was 128 days. That means it took 128 days to collect on a bill. We changed that to in six months to 90. Mm -hmm. So the money's coming in and, you know, soon. And then when I left, we were at 63 days. And that's really amazing for us. Um, as soon as we got the charges, well, we started the, the, the process. Um, and then they were sending things to collections too early. Um, you know, just a lot of it's common sense. You know, if you get a master's degree in hospital administration, they teach you these things. But, uh, to run a hospital. It, a lot of hospitals have been run um, by doctors who don't, you know, I went to medical school, they don't teach you how to run your own office, they don't teach you how to run a hospital, they don't teach you any business, you have no business. Set. Matter of fact, the guy I went to medical school with, Bob, um, his wife set up, uh, they, they rented uh, a, a space and they bought the equipment and set up and then they, uh, they paid a contract for five, a lease for five years. And the first month he had one patient, second month zero. He, you know, he, who was a doctor, his wife uh, helped design websites, but they, they, they couldn't, they didn't know how to market the skill. And he was a doctor, you know, and a good location, uh, but um, he ended up working and he still works now. He's a doctor. He still works as a prison guard in Folsom Prison, which is uh, just across the bay. Um, just because he got disheartened by the whole situation, um, he had to negotiate with the company that five-year contract, and he ended up paying about ninety percent because he signed the contract. You know, and then based on then what he showed was, would be their income, so uh, he had to take it a job, whatever, and so he started working for the prison system, and that that's kind of a sad uh, situation. So going in and negotiating a contract. You know, for the five years without any kind of plan, 
of um, how to you know arrange um, uh, you know the stream of income uh, to make that payment. Uh -huh. Sure. So yeah. Yes. You mentioned that the first meeting you kind of missed their expectations of what they really need from you, and then you kind of correct that. How often that's going to go here? How would you get those information ahead of time so you can get that documentation so you know that you are getting their demand instead of being lost? They're venture capital companies. Yeah. There's news about I uh, I would have researched all their clients. Who have they invested? How much did they invest in those people? Why did they choose those particular companies? That, that's general information. And then I would research that and see, are we a good candidate for them? Are we the type, we fit the profile of what they're interested in investing in? And then I would adjust my presentation according to what I see as their vision. Remember we talked about their vision, right? Of uh, investors. So their problem is, that's the second vision, right? Uh, their problem is we have millions and millions of dollars we want from investors that we want to invest. Now you show us why we should invest in your company. And so I told about how great our product is. They are thinking in terms of how can I use this information and change it to our, what matches what we're interested in doing, which was actually developing a beauty product. That's why they contacted me. So it was really different than the medical aspect of, of what we were doing. Because we we're FDA approved and you know, all that stuff. And, and yet they were going to use it for you. So we stayed away. Had we done our homework ahead of time before we went into that, um, we were recommended really highly by uh, this lady um, who uh, was a consultant for us uh, and, and, and investors. And she actually took us. Uh, and they would use us to them and we did the presentation. And then we, I didn't do my research ahead of time about that venture capital company. And I didn't know the type of clients they had. And I didn't know how much money they had. I didn't know how long they'd been around. I didn't know who the key players were in the company. And um, if I was president today of that company, going back in the time machine, I would have. I would have gone to LinkedIn and looked at the profile of each one of those people. And I would have found out as much as I possibly could about each one. If you're interviewing for a job, you know the name of the person that's going to interview you, check them out on LinkedIn. See with that, do you have some commonality with that person? Maybe they went to the same school you met your sister. So for uh, you, they LinkedIn, they know you're checking, it's okay. Yeah. They're actually, you're actually, you know, you're, you're actually, that's actually a benefit to you. The fact that, that oh, you have. They are happy to check in. Yeah, because I see that you're yeah. thorough investigating. Oh, okay. You don't you're not doing wrong. anything illegal. Um, my, oh, wait. <laughs> my youngest son. <laughs> my youngest son is a um, um, regional manager for uh, a beer company and uh, so he actually took LinkedIn and paid the premium for one month where you get access to all the uh, yeah. information so he used it for one month and he got the job it's, it, I'm sure you've heard of Bavaria right and he has a really good job with, with that company because he found things about the people, the two people that were interviewing him, and it, the, the, the negotiation went really smoothly because it, the chit chat you start out with in the beginning, and we haven't talked about that yet, we call it soft talk, um, um, ahead of time really helps set the stage as a more friendly atmosphere. You, the biggest problem with people in negotiation is they see it as an adversarial position. It's you against me. It's when or lose, and and that that really starts on the wrong foot. Um, in negotiations, since you're talking about uh, a job, one thing that I did at Light Management and helping you know, these people that were, um, you know, laid off, you know, and there were thousands, and thousands, and thousands of people that came in, and, and um, I, I think it was like 60 companies that I went to just to lay off people. Um, 
one of one of the uh, the big issues for them um, was understanding the interview process and how it works. And a lot of companies, the secretary that you check in with is actually part of the team and how you treat that person, how friendly and, and you know how you act with that person is really part of the team. One time, uh, my, my son who works for the area, um, actually the lady that was checking people in was actually the person in the team. So again, uh, even running across people in the parking lot, you know, um, we, you, you, you know, you need to be on your guard. It's not, you're not putting on a show during the interview process. You're, you're trying to be who you really are yourself. And again, relax. Um, if you're going to an interview, always go a day before. Like if you have, a, uh, let's say, an interview on Wednesday next week, uh, Wednesday last week, you should go there and see what the traffic's like on Wednesdays. Um, go there, see where to park, see where the room number is, all of these things that ahead of time so that you're relaxed when you go there. Um, so if I'm a medical doctor, I'll give you a couple of things too that will help you. Um, one is, if you're going to either go to an interview, um, I should have taken my own advice for you. But, uh, if you're going to an interview or doing a presentation, you should eat a banana about four hours before. <laughs> Why would you eat a banana? Because it has a calcium and serotonin. Serotonin, what it does, serotonin works in the brain and helps you focus. And it also calms you down. So uh, so I tell these people during presentations, um, and I did it for the presentation that we actually got uh, $3 million investor. Um, it's, uh, the banana, it takes about four hours for your body to digest it, and then the you, walnuts work, apple oh, work. Sweet banana, like yellow, yellow, more green. <laughs> no, really, because no, more, more yellow. Time I do that, that's true, you know? Yeah, more yellow. More yellow? Yeah. yellow. And the best banana, you know, the little yellow tiny one. Yeah, banana, in Brazil, gold banana. Gold. Yeah, it's a golden one, or apple, we call them apple banana. Oh. If you eat those, they're even better. Oh. It has a more serotonin. Apples have serotonin, walnuts have serotonin. In China, one time I was in China, they sell, uh, it looks like a pecan, but it's a little tiny pecan, it's kind of salty and a little package. Like walnut. There's a walnut, it looks like a pecan, but they're delicious. But those are actually very high in the serotonin. So what the serotonin does is it helps you focus on your presentation. If you're giving a speech, uh, I taught a negotiation class with like 8,000 people, yeah? and so, um, the first group I did in South America, I, uh, of 40 people, I found one person really got 100% on the certification exam. You need 85 to get certified, right? Mm -hmm. So one person, we had 100. And then I would do another group, one person, we had 100. I did about 10 groups, and I thought, hmm, we should have more people. Like, what's going on here? Why aren't they paying attention? It's 40 hour class, so it's eight hours a day, five days, right? So, so I decided with one group in Bogota, I went out and I bought uh, 40 bananas. Mm -hmm. And I actually gave them to them. And I bought, we don't have it here, but it's called Pony Malta. It's a malt drink. Now, your brain only uses two things for energy. Glucose and oxygen. That's it. Nothing else. So if you're studying, you'll notice, oh, God, I want something sweet to eat, right? Um, uh, because your brain is crazy. If you're learning stuff, uh, when I took my medical boards in San Francisco, for example, all the, the guys, all the doctors, uh, they had uh, uh, these uh, chocolate malt balls. Um, uh -huh. And to eat, why? Because that helps you, uh, the brain uh, connection, because the brain only uses glucose to connect. So, so taking, uh, a banana before any kind of presentation at all. Uh, four hours for a chance to digest. This helps you focus. Um, I had, what started it was that 10th class I told you about. This one lady came to me before the class and she said, no, Dr. Henry, I am so nervous when I take tests. I get really nervous. I don't know what to do. I, I, I'm really smart, but I just, I, I just get so nervous, I freeze. And I said, oh, eat a banana about four hours before the test. 
And so she got a hundred under the house. Like, oh, hmm. Maybe I should learn something here. <laughs> so the next groups when the ones I bought the bananas for, I went out in the street and I had to rob them and so they probably were really cheap. They're like three cents for a banana. I think, I think Trader Joe's like nineteen or something. Um, and then and as they were studying, I bought them a little um, it, it, it tastes like root beer, but it, it's called Tony Malta. It's a malt brand, like a malt. Brand. Um, you probably have it in Brazil. Malta Morena or um, Malta India, uh, Bavaria. The beer company actually has a drink called something Eagle. I don't know what it's called. Red Eagle or something. That's actually it's a non-alcoholic drink. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, malt. It's a malt. Drink. So those those things help. And when you go to an interview, you eat a banana four hours before you interview it. it Calms you down and, okay, and it helps you organize your, your brain. Because you, you get in there and you're really nervous and you can't think. Oh, well, give me an example of uh, where you did da 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 da. And you go, I don't know what you and, and then you make up some thing that's really not good enough. And again, that goes back to preparation ahead of time. Uh, there's a book called The 101 Questions That Are Asked in the Interview. The problem with reading the book is and memorizing is you go in, you sound like a robot, and that's really not a good thing to do. Um, you, uh, the best thing to do is look at those questions, but then answer, don't look at their answers. Think about how best you can answer those questions. They always ask you about, tell me something that um, you don't do well, right? What's your weakness? What are your strengths? And then they ask, what are your weaknesses? And then, um, you know, with weakness, you always want to talk about something that uh, my weakness was, um, for example, speaking Spanish, for example. And so, uh, so I took more courses in Spanish, for example, uh, just to give an example. So, uh, all right, let's keep going. Um, someone have a question? No? All right. Um, back and forth communication design uh, agreement while leaving the other side intact positive. Easy to negotiate when two sides have some shared interests and some um, opposed. Remember, I, I mentioned that as you meet people in the beginning, the soft talk in the beginning of the, and we call these soft skills or soft talk, uh, where you just talk about, again, if you do your LinkedIn research about that person, you know a little bit about them. You could be careful about name dropping and stuff like that, um, unless it's a legitimate um, uh, you know, aid to you. Uh, and again, uh, all parties have the right to walk away at any time and to say no. Remember that is so important in negotiation. So um, soft, again, uh, friendly negotiation. The goal is just to, to come up with an agreement. And hard negotiation, again, when you don't know the other people. Uh, uh, I didn't know anything about the county manager in, in San Francisco, for example. The goal is victory. It was actually convincing them that we could actually turn the hospital around. And in two years, actually make a profit. Now, losing $18 million a year, the taxpayers are really unhappy. Um, and if they have a hospital they can be proud of and use, I mean, the other option is to, <clears throat> this is what we told them if, if we aren't able, and we will tell you at the end of two years whether what to do. And if we determine that it's best to close the hospital, um, then that would be our recommendation. So we're going to be really, really open and honest. Uh, uh, our decision. Uh, so again, it's the interest. As I mentioned before, some interests on your part maybe not be important to them. Some things they're interested in not important to you. Oh, you want to add this and that and the other to the negotiation? If it has no impact, you do want to do some research because sometimes they will put something in those clauses. Um, you, you read about movie stars all the time where they, they sign these premarital agreements, and then they realize why certain things are in that premarital agreement ahead of time. Jumping to conclusions or making assumptions. You know the old joke, assumption, assume, means an ass out of you and me, right? Oh, you and me. <laughs> make an ass out of you and me. Don't make assumptions. Ask questions to verify. If you, if you think something, um, you want to verify. Um, you don't want to, to make assumptions at all in the negotiation. Um, you, you may assume that this job includes or that they will pay for your health insurance or, or 
credit, uh, or you assume it's not negotiable. A lot of times people don't realize certain things are negotiable. Um, they just jump to conclusions or assume. Um, and these are from um, getting TS. Fisher and, and Yuri are from Harvard University. They once came up with a win win. So, why is it from Fisher and Yuri? Yeah, these are two professors at Harvard University. Oh, they wrote a book called Getting to Yes. yes. In 1981, they wrote the book. Okay. Published so by Harvard. From Harvard. Harvard University. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I give you an example that I went to the bank and I could only borrow $92,000. Okay? So that would be not negotiable. So I made that very clear at the very beginning. He knew yeah. uh, Sometimes people think it's only the salary that's negotiable and that the company is offering you these are the health benefits we are offering this is vacation so and so and so so maybe they offer you three weeks vacation um maybe you, you should and then it's what's important to you so they are offering you three weeks vacation right so you think that that's it you know negotiate but if you want to for example belong to a professional organization like your nurse the the American Nurses Association is one of those with conflict once a year or continuing education um, or to maintain your license. Um, so you would bring that into the negotiation process itself. So uh, you may not think it's, they may say, okay, here's the benefit package and then here's three weeks vacation. Maybe you say, look, you know, I don't need three weeks vacation. You know, I, I'll take two weeks vacation, but I'll take one week. Uh, if you pay for me to go to a professional uh, continuing education course. So you can design whatever you want and present it to them. That's what I'm saying, that everything is possible in the universe. But you have to come up with what it is. Don't think that um, there's a limit to what you can negotiate. That's one of the very, just like with the, with the, um, the park, the, the group in, in Columbia. Uh, they came up with some really interesting things. What we let me tell you what we did. You know, the park went to be um, accepted in society. They've been gorilla fighters, right? Mm -hmm. So what we did was we offered them education in English and learn computer skills, completely non competitive Learning English not. Good. Learning computer science and getting jobs, and we we're helping them. We're training them in using computers, and we're developing contracts with companies in that country for these people actually doing programming for those companies. So we have that all lined out. So part of our negotiation process was we're going to help you re-enter society. Some of those people couldn't read and write, mm -hmm. so some of it was just teaching them Spanish, and uh, you know, their their you know um, how to read. And writing. Um, and then some people that were a little better educated, maybe older ones, um, then we want to put them in training where they can get a job. But we don't want them competing. Um, we don't want them in a position where there's, you know, here's my resume. I killed 77 people. I tortured 140 people. I, <laughs> I robbed these people. That doesn't go on the resume, right? Yeah. But that's what some of these people, that's what the bank's on. And uh, they kidnap people for ransom, you know, a lot of they see this. Huh? A lot of they see this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got it. Hey, I didn't think about that. Really nice. So, uh, again, is looking for things that are of value to them so that they can accept uh, the, the, the terms of the agreement. So, you're not, again, this is so important. It's not your perspective, it's seeing things from their perspective. You know, there's a, a saying, you know, if you want to know a person, walk a mile in their moccasins, right? American Indians wear moccasins with their soft shoes. And, you know, um, again, if you want to know what a person's life is, spend some time walking in their shoes. And you know exactly what they do. Uh, and we call it shadowing someone or, or following them. The more you know about the other person, the LinkedIn profile will tell you a lot. Where they went to school, for example, uh, could be important. Um, what, what organizations they support or they follow, that's really important as well. It gives you an idea, the direction, the, the push uh, that they're in. 
the emphasis. So you know that we've already talked about this. We we negotiate about everything. Um, and, uh, obvious, even at home. So active listening. Yes. When you do a win-win situation, you go in and you present something that is a winning for me and a winning for the other person. Okay. Now, um, so why why is that not a good idea? Because I may be winning something, but really leaving a lot of money on the table. I could, for example, it would be a win, I got the contract. Maybe what's important is I'm going to use this contract to show other people and get other contracts. Or this contract with this company, now I can get other contracts with this company. So you're looking a vision behind, beyond. You're not looking just today in this contract or this negotiation, but you're actually looking ahead what the value is. You follow what I'm saying? It, I don't want to use the term you're using them, but it's kind of like a vehicle uh, opening an opportunity. So when we, in Los Angeles, when we negotiated with the three hospitals and we did a really good job of improving, we used that strategy to go to the county of San Mateo to show them what we had accomplished. So it was intentional what we did. We went crazy improving those three hospitals and using that information to show the county manager what we were capable of doing. And we did what we said we would do. And they became our best advocate. They made recommendations, and we had lots of contracts based on the recommendation by the county manager. So a vision is much broader than the current contract. And a lot of people are, are what we call um, tunnel vision or, 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 or um, focused only on, on one area and not looking beyond. It, it's kind of like uh, kids. I have a nephew. He's in medical school, actually, but he wants to be a disc jockey. His parents want him to be a doctor. He loves being a doctor, but, but he's now spending more time doing the disc jockey. He's in like the halfway through medical school. Right? Um, again, um, with children, I, I didn't tell my children to do anything. Well, I told them not to become doctors because <laughs> <laughs> after I graduated from medical school, I went to Florida, Florida, Florida Hospital in New York. And um, I spent a hundred hours a week in the hospital, and um, I lived in an apartment across the street from the hospital, rain or snow or whatever, you know. Um, and so my wife said, you know, this isn't going to work. Um, and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go into administration. Um, so after I finished, you know, and I went into running hospital, to be a doctor. When you're a doctor, you only work on one. But when you're an administrator, you really have an effect over a lot of people. So vision. So you follow what I'm saying about the vision is really a larger, uh, larger term um, goal. Looking at it. because, for example, when she she's talking about a job she's applying for, uh, how does that job fit into your career path or plan? Uh, are you evaluating that job to see if this is the direction I want to go in? Uh, there's our other branches. It's like in medical school, uh, you graduate and then you specialize. And again, during medical school, when you see, uh, you get a chance to try all the different departments within you know, the hospital. And then you decide, oh, I really like cardiology or I really like oncology. And then you go in that direction. Or, um, and, and oftentimes people are influenced by some family members too. You know what I mean? Someone, um, I was just listening to a, a Harvard um, medical uh, presentation, and it's a guy that was really short. And his parents refused to give him growth hormone so that he would be normal height. And and uh, they said that the growth hormone they were taking from dead people, right, from the pituitary gland, the growth hormone giving to people, and some people were dying because of the you know, bad cow disease, that type of a, 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 a prion disease. The parents decide not to risk it to let the child be that height simply because they didn't want to lose their kid to, to a, a possibility. 
So I, again, some you know, decisions are really difficult. Um, one of the doctors I worked with her son was really short. Um, at, at another medical thing. At two years of age, if you double the height on the second birthday, that's how it's called it. So my son Matt was three feet two inches when he was two years old. He's now six feet. Mm -hmm. So I was three feet when I was two years old. So I'm six feet. So again, um, we use that in pediatrics. <laughs> Didn't know what you were going to learn today. Huh? Okay. Um, well, if if I find out that a company is doing something that I think is ethically not a good idea, I'm going to back out. For example, one of the guys who was squeezing eggs and some of the ideas that he had. I don't know. So I said, look, you know, uh, this is not my vision of how I know I can help your company, but I don't I don't agree with what what it is that you're trying to do. Um, I can't tell you what you said as opposed to those who are still trying to do. But um, again, um, you know, I, I, I can't see myself selling a car that's damaged and not telling the person that it's damaged. You know, I um I, honestly I think it's the best thing. And then in the long run, it's how you how you develop a reputation. And again, remember that in that negotiation for the job, you're starting to develop your professional reputation, and it, it, it builds on there. It can only take a short time to get it. Yeah. Again, mission. What's the long term mission? That's your vision. Uh, a long term vision is is your mission. It's what you believe in. It's the direction you want to go in. So when I was a kid, I was five years old, um, I wanted to be a doctor. Our uh, family doctor, Howie Giesner uh, from Sunnyvale, uh, was my idol. I had asthma as a kid, and he was really helpful, and he taught me a lot of things. And little kid, he took time with his patient, and I said, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to help people. And um, so my vision was helping people. And then when I realized when I was a doctor, you only help one person at a time. But if you're an administrator, if you run a hospital, for example, you help thousands of people. Um, let's see, just one was uh, influence without persuasion. Again, influence, not persuasion. You're not persuading people. You are influencing them. They need to make the decision. Persuasion means you're pushing them to make a decision. Yeah, it's like, oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Arm twisting. <laughs> Um, again, um, as I mentioned, this is really important to control your your emotions. You don't want to be emotional in, in negotiation. It shows need um, and vulnerability. Um, so again, as soon as you feel that, um, you ask a question, and we will talk a little bit about what kind of. Can you say that people who say professionally is the one teaching like the certification or the courses? Uh, it, uh, yeah, the certification is is uh, on the negotiation process. Professional, that's right. How to be a professional negotiator. Professionalism just means being professional. What does that mean? Honest, integrity, ethical. Um, uh, you... Uh, you're taking completely your emotions out of the of the negotiation process. Um, I was in a meeting once. I can't tell you what county it was, but it was the head of the medical society in California, one of the counties. And he starts crying because this person won't go along with his idea. I mean, like immaturity, right? Mm -hmm. It's not appropriate in, in a negotiation process. Um, I was on a team with him. We were supposed to be negotiating with the state of California. And the guy says, oh, you got to give it to him. Oh, please. I, I was so embarrassed. You know, I didn't know what to do. Um, and we lost the contract, so obviously. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, uh, I didn't even know how he got to the position that he was in. And I had no experience with this guy before. So it was a real surprise when I go into the meeting and this guy pulls this, you know, crying routine. Um, it's yeah, it's usually women that are are, are uh, accused of crying and stuff. But this guy I mean, we call it alligator tears. Like, tears. Because he wanted the contract. 
and so he's showing need, right? Mm -hmm. So again, when you show emotions, you're showing need and vulnerability, and also it doesn't look professional. Mm -hmm. So again, um, if you want to go to Google and put uh, value value search, oh no, value sort S O R T. If you go and you go through those 50 and, and then start listing mm -hmm. which values you think are important, it really helps give you some insight into your own personality. Um, and we did that uh, at Right Management with all those uh, 10,000 people that got laid off. We did that with all of those people, um, the value sort. Uh, again, what's the issue at hand? Some people get sidetracked. They bring things in. They introduce new ideas that are irrelevant. Um, to the situation, um, they cloudy the, the, the negotiation because it's really not relevant to. You. It's like in the United States when the Russians and Americans were arguing over the size of the table. Is it a round table or a square? Table? I don't, it doesn't belong on the table. No table. <laughs> no, that was the Prussia and and Kennedy were were arguing over the the shape of the table. And I mean, it's irrelevant, right? It has nothing to do with with nuclear. I mean, you know, with destroying the planet. I mean, it had nothing to do with. It. So, what's the issue at hand? Um, so, this is important: is to identify the difference between a need and a want. So, what do you need in the negotiation? Um, and if you go to uh, Google and put in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you will see these are needs. What you want, again, um, you want to be successful in negotiation. You have, again, you're, you're finding out at the beginning that a person has a problem. You want to identify for sure that that's the real problem because it may be something else. So that's why you ask the questions to get a vision of what the problem is. You have to convince them of what their problem is so they see it from their perspective. It's just like in life, if your parents tell you to do something and they don't tell you why, you'll do it again and again until you learn why, oh, you're not supposed to put your hand in the fire to your parents, right? Type of situation. Uh, I, again, what are the strengths and weaknesses of your position? So, Again, if you're negotiating for a position, um, you know, where did you go to school? What did you study? What was your grade point average? What projects did you work on? Um, what experience have you had? Um, maybe what's in your portfolio that relates to them, not to you, but again, it's, it's the you approach. It's what's good for them, what's important to them. Uh, self awareness, again, percent, and this is the, the, the value thing that I just talked about. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with a lot of this is about social intelligence and and uh, EI or emotional intelligence. Um, if you have a chance of, I would peruse it. Peruse means to read it very carefully about emotional intelligence. It's very important. It's more important than intelligence. Um, today, um, I should have turned off my cell phone. Um, um, I, um, I I was listening um, when I was at Harvard. Uh, I, I was listening to a lecture, and they're saying today your IQ is not important um, because with a cell phone your IQ is two hundred. Because if you ask a question, you have a problem. I mean, your IQ is two hundred because you got all of, you know you can answer all those questions that you need. So we're really, you know. Um, we're really all at about IQ 200 if you have a, a smartphone. So what's different about us? It's creativity. And when you're in a job and you're applying for a job, it's your ability to create ideas, to try new things, to look at things from new perspective. We call this synthesis. You guys know the word synthesis? Mm -hmm. Analysis is taking something apart like a computer synthesis is putting them back in a different way to do something different like you know like et call home right put all those things together to, to call 
And that's what synthesis is. It's taking a new, taking things that are available, but putting them together in a different way. So um, my job was taking things that relate to hospitals and putting it together in a new way, a um, new perspective about treatment. Uh, social intelligence, again, these are skills often uh, start at the dinner table with your parents. Um, if you have a good uh, role model, um, sometimes um, parents are stricter, some, some are more lenient with their kids. Um, but eventually we develop our own um, social intelligence. And you can look that up on Google as well, just review. Uh, remember that emotional, you know, if you take a look at CEOs and companies, and um, they all have pretty much similar IQ, right? They're like between uh, 115 and 125 and, and IQ. Um, if you want to graduate from college, you need an IQ average, which is 100. 102, 103. Uh, if you want to go to graduate school, it's like 107. Uh, which may be expected more. Um, and that's, and in the United States, we have almost 40% of people that do college. Right? Um, some don't finish, but most of them do. Some go on to graduate school. But it's not intelligence, again, that sets people apart. It's, it's the creativity, what you do with that. Um, that you're looking at a different approach, a different perspective on solving problems. Kind of like the space program. Different people have ideas about going to Mars, and everyone has a different way of doing that or how to live there. Um, again, uh, we don't even know if there's life there yet. Recognition um, growth, that'd be aware of pleasant consequences. Um, oh, yeah, that, that's the that key point. So, one thing that you need to be aware of in the negotiation is to help that in that vision we're talking about for them to see not only can you solve the problem better, but what happens if they don't use your idea and they go with someone else, okay? So what, what are they going to miss out on, um, like a, a contract? So it could be the connection with yeah, and again, it varies from individual situation. But again, you need to be very well aware of what it is that you have to offer, and then by not choosing you, um, that option is lost to them. Uh, um, I have a lot of examples of companies. It's just like you don't go with, uh, for example, this one company was using software from, from uh, this one other company. And, and uh, they were getting behind. And, and the other company in Malaysia was asking them to do all kinds of things that weren't in the country. And you know, they said, hey, you're, we do that. Or you're, and, and so they went behind the company. And the people said, you know, we're going to cancel the contract. And, and so you know, my boss pointed out, we're going to lose all this time that we spent because we're close to finishing. But you need to rein in your employees and stop them from asking us to do things outside of the contract. So it was actually renegotiation of the contract. Because what happened is, oh, we're, we're aligned with, uh, with your company. And then now, so then they started calling us up and asking simple questions. And then they asked us for tasks. And oh, so and so didn't show up today. Can you help us out by doing that, 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 that? And it started growing and growing like a little cancer, you know? And pretty soon, we're spending 50% of our time doing things that are on our contract. And then we're yelled and screamed at by the president because we're behind schedule. And we would have been ahead of schedule had we not. And so that's, we had to, and then, so we actually had to fly to Malaysia and sit down with the guy um, and explain to him the situation with his technical people. And so we got it very clear what the situation was, and not a back on track. And they end up paying us for the time that we spent solving their problem. Because not only was it bad, but they were taking advantage of the situation as well. Some of the employees were actually, oh, now that you've done this, uh, uh, could you just finish the other part of it? Yeah, type of thing. And um, again, uh, remember that word no. You need to learn that, you know, there's no stigma attached to it. Um, 
you know, um, if those of you, some of you are shy or meek uh, or afraid to speak up for yourself, I strongly recommend that you go on the internet and just take a real short course in assertiveness behavior. Assertiveness, so we have people that are shy, we have people that are aggressive. Assertive people don't get taken advantage of because they know when to say no. And it helps you to understand how to go about doing it in a professional, a nice way, a friendly way. So, assertiveness. assertiveness training. I'll, I'll, I'll write it up okay. Okay. Really important is, is also emotional intelligence. Um, understand what that is and how it relates to you. Will you really help? Huh? EQ. Yeah. Right. They abbreviated EQ. Emotional quotient. Emotional intelligence. When you say like the the negotiation certification, how what was the process to get it? It's a forty hour course. Forty hour from where? Of the the uh, Camp Institute in in Walnut Creek. Um, on site, on site courses or online? Uh, they they do. I do them in person, so I'm I'm not sure exactly. If you if you put in Google Camp Institute, C A M P, and then Institute, and they put a professional expert negotiation certification, it'll tell you how to go about doing that. I don't know if they have an online course. An expert professional negotiator. Yeah, and then people are actually certified negotiators. We do this. A, a lot of people like uh, people in supply chain where they're negotiating or purchasing people. Mm. And then you say the forty hours mostly on site for the, or can be you don't know. The courses that I teach, yes, oh, but okay. um, I teach those in South America. I don't teach them here. I teach them in Spanish there. So I don't know here um, how they run them, um, but if you contact um, the Camp Institute in Walnut Creek, um, C A M P, um, they they can tell you about how to go ahead and get sort of thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're, I think we're out of time here. Um, so there's a, a lot more things. I hope I've given you some introductions to my views. That you're starting and thinking differently. Remember to to um, defuse the word no. It's just a, a negotiation thing. It's just like yes or no. It's um, now the worst thing is maybe or perhaps because you really don't know anything. And you, so you never want to get to maybe or perhaps because that doesn't tell you to continue or to drop. It. It's like a guy says uh, to the lady, will you marry me? And she says, <laughs> So what does that mean? Buy a ring or not? Yes. Oh, right. look for another <laughs> girlfriend? <or? laughs> uh, you don't want to marry a girl like that anyhow, right? Just, uh, no. Oh, wait, what about bluffing? Yeah. Bluffing, you have to be able to back it up. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine uh, went to his boss and said, uh, I want to race. And he said, um, I'm looking at other jobs, and if I don't get a raise, I'm going to leave. So the boss said, well, <laughs> he had unemployment for six or eight months. He had nothing lined up. He was bluffing that he had a better, I think he said that he had a better offer or something. I think it's not bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was lucky because he didn't have another one. Uh, threat English because he would have had it. That's threat because that means you have the power. Bluffing, you don't have the power. Very different. Oh, okay. um, again, um, when you're negotiation, you, it's fun to practice it with somebody. Uh, you're a devil's advocate. They're always will try and pick apart your argument or, or your perspective or your approach. Um, and again, is, 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 this is just doing your research, right? Um, so here's the information I gathered. That's what my son did. He called me up 
dad, I'm going to negotiate for the plan for the job as a commission architect. So he went through the process with me, and then uh, negotiating for the benefits for the job. Again, I asked him to tell me well, what are you going to say in the meeting, and then I gave him some advice. I don't want to change and make it my approach. I want it to be his. When I question him, is this really important or is this more important? Again, that goes back to your value system, that value sort that I mentioned that you can do on online. Always, uh, sometimes you get hit with some new information or something comes up in negotiation and you, you say something like, I need to think it over. I need to think of what you just said. Uh, can my team, can we take a, a couple minutes to just have a little chat? Um, um, uh, and there's something that I'm going to try to digest and then we'll get back to you. So do this Again, if you feel pressure, remember the need thing. So if you feel pressure, you want to stop the pressure. So if the pressure is to make a decision there, just go and just take a deep breath. You don't even have to do anything. Just go outside the room and, you know, da 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 and then, you know, you can take a deep breath and come back in. Again, you, you, because if they put pressure on you, then you're going to respond, and it may be a, an emotional response. Again, you want to stay away from your emotional response. Even though the banana. <laughs> 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 yeah. Do you know what the term devil's advocate means? Oh, devil's advocate means. I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with your proposals. So, like, if she's negotiating for a job, and I'm saying I'm going to practice interview with her, and every time I ask her a question, she says something, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I'm going to say uh, how I see that as a negative. So I'm poking holes in her argument. I'm saying that's really not important to the company. It's important to you. It's not important to the company. So focus on the you perspective, the perspective of the company. When you're negotiating, you're negotiating because they want something and you want to show the value to them. If you show the value to yourself, then they don't care. Oh, I'm going to buy a new Mercedes if I get this job. Right? Uh, again, um, always from their perspective. That's the devil's advocate. In, you know, it's like the devil tells you to do something right? um, or not do something. Again, um, in English, the devil's advocate means looking at holes in the argument, looking at the weaknesses in the, in the, in the argument. This is the bad night I told about. Best alternative to a negotiating agreement. Again, you guys all have access to these slides so you can uh, review them. Uh, and, and again, you need to know ahead of time what you can walk away from in a negotiation. Uh, and sometimes in a negotiation, you find out that what those people's, just like I was talking about the venture capital people, when I found out what they wanted to do to our company that we built up, it destroyed it, basically, the concept. And we believe in our concept and the product and the value, the medical value of the product. And they were looking at the cosmetic, literally, the cosmetic value of the product. Bluffing, uh, again, it, 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 uh, there's a whole, you know, hour I can talk about body language. And then, uh, if they're talking, it's better, right? As I mentioned before. Uh, body language, again, leaning forward shows interest. You can review a, a little short course on body language. It's kind of fun because uh, when people fold their hands or they cross their arms, uh, that means you're not getting through to them. That means that they don't believe what you're saying. So again, you have to just look if they cross their leg. I mean, any of those those things are they're blocking themselves away from you. We do things without knowing what we're doing. So if you read body language, like a little short course on it. For example, if I say something and uh, let's say he's embarrassed, his face will turn red. He can't stop it. He can't control it. We cannot control our emotions. It takes a lot of work. In negotiations, it takes a lot of work to control your emotions. You know, people say something, uh, uh, you know, like my daughter's with cute, so people say things, she blushes, right? 
you know, they, they compliment her and, and she blushes. She's learned to control that. And just, and you know what you say when someone says something nice to you? The worst thing that you can say is, oh, yeah, well, I have another sister. She's more beautiful, right? No. Or, or, <laughs> and that's putting down what the person's saying to you. It's a compliment. They say thank you. Also, if somebody tells you something you don't like, remember, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with them. Mm -hmm. It's their opinion. And so you say thank you for sharing. Oh God, you look ugly today. Where you? Your clothes are all wrinkled. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's not about you. It's about them. And they probably have that problem or have had that problem before. And you remind them of that problem. And so you're triggering a response from them. It has nothing to do with you. Some people get, yeah, it's basic stuff. Any, anyone gets angry with you, it's because you remind them of something they don't like about themselves. Mm -hmm. And again, psychology classes do help you in negotiation. And body language, reading other people is really uh, important in negotiation. Uh, with the uh, gorilla fighters, they were kind of interesting because they're, they're, you know, they're tough people. You know, I mean, really tough. I mean, you know, they just they break your neck and do it. Uh, I have to think. But when we were negotiation, um, uh, in negotiation about creating a vision in their mind about how their life would be better, their eyes opened up and they became very bright and they became very friendly and they continued negotiating. Why? Because we were looking at it from their perspective, yeah. their vision of how their life would be better. And now it's been very successful. Uh, and now we've got the first group that have graduated from computer science. They have jobs now. Uh, we just went, uh, I didn't, but one of the people in my in the company, the DD guy, uh, went back and gave certificates to each one of those 40 kids that finished the first course. And so they're, that's right now. The problem, I hope, is the president of the company, of the country, is, is uh, kind of like Trump, you know, he's kind of real strong uh, conservative and is not letting us do things that we think would be helpful to these people. So, so we're backing off, but we're still concentrating on helping those people develop job skills. Um, um, you can read these over. Uh, again, be open to new information. Uh, when you get new information and you have a group team, uh, team, get together and discuss the new information. When you're in a negotiation with the people on your side, always take notes. Don't take copious, long notes, because that means you're not paying attention. Hey, just short, um, um, when, when I was in medical school, um, I developed my own code because I couldn't write these long words. You know, a lot of medical words are pretty long. So I invented a, uh, a shorthand. Um, and so I use that in negotiation. Um, I, if someone says something, oh, wow, I didn't realize. Oh, man, that's interesting. <laughs> and then I get together with my group and I said, did you see his reaction when we talked about that? No, oh, no, I didn't. I said, yeah, I think that's a, a point that we can negotiate. Again, paying attention to their body language. Because if you're looking at your paper, you're not paying attention to their body language. And their body language, again, is really important. Are they listening? Are they paying attention? Do they have eye contact with you? If they're not, um, also, really important negotiation. In the very beginning, you want to make sure you know who the decision maker is. Um, there are what we call gatekeepers, who people who talk and they act like they make the decision, but they really talk. So sometimes you would say things like, um, well, do you think so-and-so might be interested in, in hearing of what we're talking about from your perspective? Um, who are some of the decision makers that are really going to be affected by um, Because that person, is, they, they feel power because they have their gatekeepers to get you in to talk to the person who really is a decision maker. And it works the other way too. When I was negotiating in a negotiated one time ago with, with President Carter, the real decision maker was actually Joe Omick and Stu Eisenstadt, who's actually the chief of staff and, and the head of his health department. So it was actually redirecting. So he really wasn't going to make the decision. He wanted us to negotiate because his father died of cancer. And so he wanted us to be involved in changing the national cancer. But in order to put it into law, he wanted us to work with the person that you like for changing the law. 
So again, who is the real decision maker? Mm -hmm. um, and he, yes. No, it's like good cop, bad cop. You, I would do that. The bad cop is the, the devil's advocate. Uh, you want it to be professional and friendly terms. Uh -huh. uh, take brief notes, as I mentioned. Right there. And uh, focus, again, that banana really comes in handy, that serotonin. Are those, those uh, are they, are they call Chinese walnut? They're little tiny ones, but they're delicious. Again, if people attack you, get back to what the problem is about that vision. What do you see as the problem? If they're attacking you, uh, this is called baggage, where you have past experience with the people you're negotiating with. Maybe you didn't follow through on the last one, so you have to show now why they would trust you in, in the future. It's called baggage. Or we heard about your company that you're that, 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 that important. In, this. in English, the word baggage means bad experiences. But in Spanish, baggage just means previous experience. I don't know in other languages. But in English, if you're carrying around baggage, that means you're carrying around past ex bad experiences. For example, uh, oh, you should go to a chiropractor. Oh, I don't believe in chiropractors. I had a bad experience. With well, it'd be open. I mean, I, I, again, a person has a certain experience previously uh, with a, a, a situation. Um, okay, listening, 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 I think, and, and analyze and synthesize. You got the words here. Again, uh, this is just a review of what I've talked to you about. So. Walking away, memo. Uh, write a note or memo if a uh, contract or agreement is required. Again, let me tell you what, you remember I told you about this guy, uh, uh, Mandel, who was the former president of California Hospice. He taught me, when you go into a meeting, as soon as you come out of that meeting, you write down everything about the meeting. What we discussed, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that, this date, that date, everything. If it comes later, say, hey, I told you to paint that thing in. Oh, well, here's my notes of the meeting. I send it to you, and I said that if anything isn't correct or I left something out, please let me know in 24 hours. If I don't get a note back, I'll assume that that information is correct. And there's nothing in here about painting. The people get, sometimes they get upset about it. But, oh no, I said that. You didn't put it in there. I said, I sent this. Anyway, um, so the best thing to do, especially if you have a boss that you take advantage of you or take credit for what you do, um, it's always good to cover yourself and so um, protect yourself. Always protect yourself in the job. Um, I had one of my students, um, she got an MBA from uh, the course that I was teaching. <clears throat> and in her first job, her boss would have her do his work plus her. And so she called me up about six months later and she said, Mr. I have a, a, a question. Uh, and she told me the situation, and I said, you need to get a job. Too. She left, got another job. You know what that guy did? He called up the new company and said, I was her boss before. I, uh, I'm the one that really came up with all the ideas. You need to hire me to be her boss. So she called me up again, and, and I said, yeah, the guy was crazy. I said to her, go and sit down with the company and explain to them the situation. And if you want, tell them that you talked to me about it before, and, and I'll be more than happy to explain that you want to talk to me about it, and this is what the situation, and this is the advice that I gave you. And um, the guy, the president of the was really nice, and, and, and the point not understood, didn't call me, and uh, everything worked, and they didn't hire him, and he's unemployed. Um, there are people like that who will take advantage of you. And just like take advantage of you in negotiation, it's the same thing. That's why just doing a short course in, in uh, assertiveness training is so important because it will help you uh, to uh, be able to express your views without trouble. We talked about assuming, remember, don't make assumptions. Verify the information by asking questions. Uh, remember the big picture, the big vision, long term, not just the short term. Um, some people come up with stories and hype and facts, you know, and they try to you know, put pressure on you. Again, 
stick with the facts. Um, again, time factor, some people feel pressure of time. Unless it's a life and death situation, which I, you know, I've come across a number of times in the hospital, but in most negotiations, it's not a life and death issue. You, you should have time to think about it. Like I said, take time, let's do it. Um, if you expect them to give you something in return that you give them, you're being naive. That's not going to happen, right? People see a free lunch, they're not going to they're not going to uh, leave a tip, for example. Again, avoiding conflict, uh, that means you're not being assertive. Um, just some basic assertiveness training is how to say no or how to express your ideas without insulting or make the other person angry. Some people try to show off. That's a big, men are a little more responsible for trying to show off than women. Um, uh, trying to prove how smart you are. And when, whenever you do that, the people are probably smarter than you are, and they probably use it against you. Um, that talking too much, again, is a sign of need. If you're asking questions, it's professional, and you're doing your job, and you're creating a vision. If you're talking about yourself and your product from your perspective, they don't care. It has nothing to do with them. It's the value to them that's really important. Uh, again, another error in negotiation is not listening. Or we call that active listening. Again, when you're taking a shorthand note, again, later after the meeting, you go back and you rewrite the, the note. Just like in medical school, you know, the problem with medical school is everything's important. So you have to write almost everything. So I used to tape record, type up everything, you know, um, because everything was important. And um, the same thing with negotiation. You can record, but you have to ask permission if you want to record it. Sometimes what happens, though, and this happened a couple times to me, is the other people are, are not going to say certain things because they know it's going to be So, again, um, the, and you always ask permission. Um, do you mind if I take some brief notes just to remember some of the things? Because, we, you know, if we get together and we talk about and I want to think about something, I'm going to write them down, but I, I don't want to interrupt our negotiation process. So I'm just going to take some brief notes. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, if you think it's important to, for example, when I was negotiating, in, uh, negotiating for a president of the university, I said, look, I'm negotiating on his behalf, but really, he's going to make the decision. Is it okay if I record and then play it and I can explain to him what we discussed? And they gave me permission to do that. So, again, always ask permission for what you're doing. So, uh, questions as a percent of negotiating behavior. Skilled negotiation people, uh, professionals, 21% of the time they're asking questions. Average negotiations, less than half. They're not asking questions, right? They're just mm -hmm. talking about themselves, right? And their product, and their perspective. Um, and this is uh, called the bargaining advantage. Um, it's, it's an interesting article from the uh, citation. Um, active listening, again, uh, for uh, what we call listening comprehension or uh, understanding. Skilled negotiators, again, uh, are um, actively listening twice as, more than twice as much, much as, can say, as the average negotiator. Summarizing, again, when you're in negotiation, you want to verify what you've heard to make sure that what you hear is what they're saying. Because some say, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah. So that's why you want to summarize what they've said back to them and then to help verify uh, that information. And then this is talking about um, the um, total information exchange. You can see that skilled negotiators give a lot more information um, in the negotiation process. This is the, uh, the, the six-step process in the negotiating process. Again, what's the real problem? Sometimes it's like a patient comes to a doctor and says, oh, I got this rash, um, I, I must be allergic to something. And then you look and you say, no, it's bed bugs, for example. It's on some other cause. Again, you want to see what the, the real problem is. Um, and the real need on both sides. And that's creating those four visions of stuff. 
uh, restate it, um, and then create the vision in the, in the mind of the adversary. So they see what the real problem is in their mind, and they see how your solution will be the best um, for them. Uh, again, what are the features uh, and benefits of your solution to their problem? Could be the price, could be the time it takes to get it done. Um, it could be um, something in the future. And again, you're helping them decide on the best solution by creating, but you're giving them the information, creating the vision. You're influencing them, but you're not putting pressure on them. You're just having, and then um, reaching a consensus. Um, and the last part's about salary negotiations. Um, again, um, I already went through this with you, but I'll just kind of quick review. Remember, know what you're worth. So the salary negotiation, salarysurvey.com uh, is one of them. Postpone talking about salary until it's offered because you want to talk about other things about the position to make sure it's a good fit. Because if you go in and talk about the price and then you find out later, it's not the job that you want. So you need to know more about the position. Having to make the first offer, as I mentioned with my son, they said, you make the first offer. You tell me what you work. And he said, that's great. <laughs> so I told him, that's great, because now you can show them what you work. And well, so far, the position is attractive, and I'm sure uh, you pay a fair salary, don't you, right? So, and then what's a fair salary? And then now you show the three negotiations, right? The three salary negotiation examples. Uh, back up with data. Don't bluff. Back up with real data right? um, in salary survey and reliable, like salarysurvey.com. Um, remember that the salary um, offer is not fixed. Uh, they may offer you a salary, but then you have a counter offer with them. And again, that's your research where you're going and evaluating. Uh, the value of, um, of your skills that you're offering them. Don't give away money. Uh, a lot of people do this. Oh, hey, I, I, I mentioned the position paid fifty-seven thousand dollars, but I'll take I'll, I'll take fifty thousand. You just negotiated against yourself, and now they know you're going to do that. They'll take you down another ten percent. So don't negotiate against yourself. Let them make the first offer. They want you to do the first offer, then do your salary survey. Look at you know at least three salary surveys um, in your area. You can call up an HR director. Uh, you know the county has a service where they actually help you find jobs, write resumes, and all that. And they're a good source. Alameda County has one, for example, uh, Human Resource Department. Um, talk to them about, um, hey, I, I look at this, how it's everybody this I have. You have some more information that I could use to help me um, um, stress that. Uh, these are just other things that are uh, negotiable. Uh, memberships, uh, protected time, space and equipment, all of these are. Uh, some people think that, oh, if I behave myself, I, I'll get rewarded, right? Uh, it, it's like Good Samaritan. <laughs> I thought it was an accident, so now it's looking pretty bad. So I pulled over on the doctor. So, I, you know, in an emergency, you can need help. And his wife got mad at me. And I'm trying to help, you know. So again, sometimes you think you're 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 being helpful, uh, but good behavior isn't always justly rewarded. Um, and again, it's, it, you know, it's not on the behavior; it's focusing on the vision. Again, what is the problem? Some people want to go in negotiation and want to be liked. They want to make new friends. That's not the place to make friends. You're not there to be liked. You're there to be professional and be respected. That's it. You're not there to be friends or develop friendships. Maybe you will develop later on in, with more negotiation, but that's not a reason to go into negotiation. And again, if you're negotiating, sometimes you feel like you're hurting the other person's feelings. Again, if you're assertive, you're saying, look, this is what I'm worth. This is what I, uh, I feel is fair um, and reasonable for this position. So you're not, uh, one of the guys I worked with in right management, uh, you know, higher up, 
he came to me and he said, they want me to be a manager. And he was a, a senior uh, program. And what do you mean manager? And um, he was making $60,000 a year as a program, which is, should be made, making 90 or more. And so he went into the negotiation and told the guy that in my previous job I was making $94,000 a year. And so they said, how much money do you want as a manager? And he said, oh, I want 200000 He said, okay. Next day, he's talking and coffee. All the other guys are making $250. He's making 200 He didn't do his research ahead of time. He didn't know what he was worth. First of all, he knew what he was worth as far as program. He knew that he should be making 94000 but he accepted 60000 in the startup company. So um, in the United States, some people are closed mouth about how much money they make, and they won't tell anybody else, or they'll tell you something that's not true. Yeah. Um, so um, the reason that so he talked to these two people, and there were other man he was in the manager meeting, and it, it had to do with oh I I don't qualify for a loan because I have to be making two hundred. Two hundred and forty thousand a year. I'm only making two hundred thousand. What? All the managers here are making two hundred and forty plus. So that's how he knew because he didn't qualify for the loan. So it came out later on. His, he actually it was a stupid mistake. He actually dated the HR lady, mm -hmm. one of the ladies, and found out that they were correct at that point. I said his name's Ivan, and I said Ivan. That is a story for this thing. Um, again, if you're asking permission from them, that's showing me, right? Um, disqualifying, uh, this needs to be done. Uh, is that okay? So you're asking permission, that's showing me. Um, there's a lot of examples in that. Don't apologize um, um, and invite disagreement to. Uh, you may not like this, but so they're not going to like it, right? Okay. Um, but if you use that in a skillful way, negotiation will work. But that's like an advanced negotiation thing. But so let's say you can go with the competitor. Um, that's great. You know, but you're going to have to reprogram. You're going to have to change the computer system. You're going to have to start from scratch. Um, you're going to have to retrain all your employees. You're going to have to do this and that. So it's not a bluff. It's actually reality of what what, what happens if they don't continue to like the go with the you know, the person. The one I was mentioning the guy in Malaysia. So this is a, I've added some stuff about assertion this at the end for you people, um, <clears throat> showing how you feel uh, when you do when when you talk about the money. I feel like that's more important than the lives of the patients, for example. A lot of times money comes up instead of lives. Uh, I mean, there's you know, an you know, excess amount of money. Um, I feel uh, because uh, pauses are really important um, because it gets people's attention. Is it? You got all your attention? <laughs> You're stuck, you're reading your emails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We also do that. No post. <laughs> post, post. Um, we're, we're, we've kind of gone over time, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, this is just, uh, again, uh, and then uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, again, um, it's their view and our view. Uh, the test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two uh, opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Mm -hmm. Again, that's your vision and their vision. Again, uh, this is their vision of the problem. This is what you see. So you need to convince them. Uh, you now see these two views, but you need to show them, influence them about that you know, that's part of the problem, but here's the real problem, and here's the long-term results if you follow this, this uh, tactic. Uh, don't attack people, don't dwell on people. Um, uh, again, stick at the interest at hand. These are just, 
a lot of negotiation is really common sense um, when you think about it. Um, don't burn bridges or close doors behind you. Shut up. Okay, we're not going to negotiate with you anymore because uh, you're not being honest. You know, maybe later on you're going to need those people. So, again, always be diplomatic. Always be professional. Um, the end result should be acceptable to both parties. And, um, again, uh, again, the uh, uh, knowing what you would be willing to accept. So just like with the salary negotiation, uh, my son now knew that what he would accept was $74,000, not $58,000, right? So he knew that that was his best alternative because anywhere else in Silicon Valley, he's going to get that other amount. Um, again, discussing ideas, developing relationships. Um, don't give too much credit. I, you know, it, it's negotiation. It's not about making people feel good or creating friendships, as I mentioned before. Um, so remember that you are an asset, so you're a value, that's why you're there. Um, and uh, make sure that you present yourself that way and professionally and respectfully to the other people in the, in the negotiation. These are some more uh, terms, um, again, that, um, being realistic about what's possible, don't ask for something that's impossible. Like you're asking for an absurd salary increase, and you know that they don't even have a budget for it. And a negotiated agreements where you agree, again, write down afterwards and then um, sign it. Um, that ICU CCO that I split up, the doctors were arguing about how to do that. So I brought all the doctors down, that we're going to use the ICU CCO, about 50 doctors. And and I had a big table, and I said, here's the plans. Here's the architect who's a specialist in ICUCC. Here are the plans. If you go along with this, if you don't want to be here, we're here to negotiate about making the intensive care at coronary care in the UK. Anyone that's not interested in that, I'll ask you to do it. I said, here's the plan. We had the architect. Well, first of all, I, I brought in the architects the second time. And then I said, they're going to draw plans and ask for input from other people. Got it. A week, four days later, I brought the architects back with the plans and I had each one sign the page by page. Every doctor, so like 45 submissions on each page. And then, and it went smoothly because you don't get any problem. Oh, you didn't ask me. You didn't. And one of the big problems in doing stuff is oftentimes you don't get input from the people that are really affected. Like if you're negotiating for someone else. Uh, there's no perfect style of negotiating. Use your own personal style of things that feel comfortable to you. A again, put yourself in their shoes. Try to imagine it from their perspective. Again, um, telling jokes is not a really good idea and, and humor. It doesn't work in negotiation. It, 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 it pulls away from being professional or serious about it. I did it for you just to give a couple of examples, but in negotiation, you don't want to do that. Um, these are your initial responses. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can use it. Right. Okay, but not during the hot negotiation. Correct. After negotiate, agree on something. Then you can go back to the soft talk. Back to the soft talk. <laughs> Again, counter responses don't feel obligated to respond right away. Big decisions don't have to be made unless it's, unless it's a life and death issue and probably won't be involved in too many of those. Take breaks when you need them. Um, <clears throat> um, a lot of people negotiate. My cousin um, um, worked as a head janitor for the schools in Stockton. And there was a, a, a chlorine gas leak in the lab. And the students all evacuated. Someone had to go turn it off. So he went and turned it off. He damaged 70% of his money. And so the um, insurance said they won't pay. And then he sent a letter back and said, wait a minute, I don't even know. They said, no, it's not a doctor. Right? So I wrote a nice letter for him, and they approved. Because the insurance companies 
will always deny, even if it's part of the contract. Mm -hmm. I even showed them where it was in the contract, right? So that they couldn't say anything. But still, the, the insurance companies don't want to pay anything for anything. Mm -hmm. They say it's not covered, even if it's covered. Yeah. They'll make up some excuse. Yeah. It's not on time. It's not this and not that. And you just have to hold your ground with that. You have to be assertive. Again, yeah, that's where asserting this comes in hand. Um, so that's what this is about. Um, being prepared. Um, sometimes there are cultural factors. Um, the um, company in, in, in South America that I'm working with, called Ruby Diamond, um, she sold a company to uh, Japan, to a company in Japan. Um, she gets to Japan and she said, and, you know, in Japan, you don't see women in business, I mean, in work at all. And so, um, so here's a woman, um, and, and she's really smart, really sharp. She started like 25, uh, now 20, only one kid. And that's just the opposite. Usually 20 companies only one is successful. So she's going to sell the company. Um, and so she said, look, I'm a woman. I'm here in Japan. I'm the best person to present this company to you. I know you're interested in buying it. That's called inserting. Um, I, I know that you're interested in buying it. I'm the best person to present it. I have my accountant here, my CPA, uh, the chief financial officer, um, who will present if you want. Uh, but um, I'm, you know, I'm the person that's best to present the. We have a problem. Now, of course, they did, but they didn't say anything. So that allowed and gave her permission to go ahead and present. And she got a really nice price for the company. So, um, and it worked. Because if the other guy, if Orlando would have done the presentation, it wouldn't have gone as well. It probably would have been maybe $20 million different. So quite significant. So again, different cultures, right? Women uh, have different roles, like in Japan, for example, the men. And some other companies, uh, it could be gay people, it could be older people, it could be a certain religion, it could be, you know, there are people are you know, about all kinds of stuff. These are just some more strategies. Um, again, um, looking at clues, again, this goes back to body language, watching the body language. D don't make promises you can't keep. Uh, again, I'll take it back to the group. We'll see if that's possible that we can carry that out uh, rather than try to seal the deal and then later on find you can't deliver on time. A lot of people make promises to deliver things on time and they get the contract signed and then they go over budget. NASA has this all the time. Every time there's anything NASA does, it always goes over time, over budget. I don't know why they need a new negotiator, I think, at NASA. Um, the final negotiation strategy, again, uh, if, it's, if it's close, so uh, again, be careful about rejecting it, you know, offhand. Look at the bad part and the good part and try it, and, and, and you keep honing and, and getting closer and closer to, to uh, a negotiating agreement. Uh, withdraw uh, to consider it with your side, again. Take time out during the negotiation. Sit down with those people that, that are on your team um, to discuss it. And uh, again, uh, don't judge who the person is, like it's a woman in Japan, for example, or a gay person, or a disabled person, or an older person, or a younger person. Uh, when I was a hospital administrator, I was 24. People say, you're too young to run a hospital. I would get that all the time. Um, and um, I, I finally just ignored it, but, but I would get that comment a lot. Um, it's just like the lady that's running for president, right? She's about 37. It's kind of, you have to be 35, the lady from Hawaii, Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. And a lot of people are talking about her age, you know? And then they're talking about the other people because they're too old. I mean, you know, what, what's the deal? <laughs> um, and I, I talked about the ICU, CCU for the county hospital and how that worked on how I got everyone to sign off on it and always stay on good terms. And we talked about the preparation. Again, do your homework, do your research. Uh, again, remember that it's not your point of view, it's their perspective. 
So it's the you approach. It's what are you interested in? What's best for you? Because it's not what's best for me in the negotiation. It's what's best for them. They're going to negotiate best on, on getting benefits for them, not for you. Um, I just added some things at the end about resumes and writing resumes. Let me tell you a big mistake that people make with writing resumes. They put it on their resume that um, a job description is what they've done. Anybody that has a job has the same job description, so they have the same resume. So, oh, I was an administrative assistant, I did this, 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 this. Well, everybody's an administrative assistant, does the same thing. How does that differentiate you? Differentiate. That, in a resume, you tell what your value is, what you have achieved. Now, this is the position, but this is what I achieved in that position. And the more numbers you put in there, the better. You make sure that they're accurate. But, uh, for example, the, I gave you the example of the county hospital in San Francisco. Lost $8 million in one year. The first year that I did it under contract, we made, well, actually, we were still $250,000 in debt instead of $18 million. And then the next year, we were $8 million up. So, again, um, having numbers to back it up. And then, of course, I listed one of my references to account manager. Um, and that's how I got the job at Sam. But I didn't marry Bill Gates' daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll worry about people that are fool's daughter. <laughs> my wife is what? Is a fool's daughter. <laughs> He's a famous lawyer, then. <laughs> Is that important? <laughs> See, that has nothing to do with the negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an interesting thing because people will bring things up and not relevant yeah. to it. Okay. And so you need to get people back on track <laughs> on what we're doing. Good negotiating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I talk about serotonin. Uh, good night's sleep before you go into a negotiation, always. Uh, light breakfast, banana, caffeine. no caffeine. What does caffeine do? No focus. It, yeah. <laughs> it speeds up your heart. Yeah. And then you get nervous. And, um, and this is um, this is about preparing for an interview for a job. Uh, you go to Google, you can look at a thousand different questions they will ask you in an interview. Uh, just be yourself. Um, again, if you're relaxed. Um, they're doing some interesting things at Google. I have one of my uh, one of my friends kid uh, apply for a job at Google. I don't know if they do this in other things, but they gave him an Excel uh, information, and they said make a spreadsheet. They give you one hour to make a spreadsheet on this. They gave him. They gave him an hour to develop this one. I don't know. They're still doing it. They're still doing it. Yeah, it's a technical one. And that is uh, only the, maybe the second page. Let me give you my love. He got the job. So yeah. that, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. That, you know, it, well, it's like in medical school. If they have a certain, like, um, one of the hospitals I worked in, they said, have you had experience with AIDS patients? Um, because, you know, a lot of the patients in that particular hospital have AIDS. Um, and so I hadn't had it, so I didn't get the job. Um, um, and that, and uh, it was a hospital in New York. Um, and so I went in the distraction. My wife said, 100 hours a week? <laughs> uh, and these are uh, uh, some examples on, on Google about questions, and they'll give you some answers to two tough questions. You know, Again, the, the, the famous question is, why should I hire you? And you should be prepared to answer that question. Here's my portfolio. You know, you're designing websites for this hotel. These are uh, some uh, that I have already done. This is the experience that I have. So that you show that, that connection. Again, the job you're applying for, you may not have experience with. So you need to show creativity, innovation, and follow through in previous things that you have done. Or volunteer work that you have done. And again, be prepared. I already talked about that. I talked about the Excel or Google. Just 
check out Glassdoor for company reviews. They'll tell you a review about that company you're going to cite for, or even you're going to negotiate with them. You want to find out about that company. And um, go to the New York Times, check them out in LinkedIn, the people you're going to negotiate with. Again, all of this is helpful in your background information. And that way it shows that you're prepared. You know who you're going to negotiate with. Um, I have one person who's going to negotiate with um, um, Salesforce. And um, so she did all the background research. It was really good because it really helped her in the interview. Because she knew this guy's background, what the company he worked for before, why he decided to go to uh, Salesforce from the company he was in. in that was Salesforce. The other one was in again. He was with LinkedIn before, then he went to Salesforce. And then she knew about the history about it. So she talked to him. And so that was part of the small talk, the soft talk in the, in the beginning of the negotiation. Um, there are different kinds of interviews. Um, when my son applied for the job working for Valeria, he also before worked as a manager for Colby. And um, they both did almost the same thing. They gave him an IQ test. <laughs> and, and yeah, they did. And it's, you know, it's like these puzzles, mm -hmm. and which two are the, are, are the same? Which one is, if this one's first, this second is third, which one goes fourth? And you have to choose which one. So uh, both times, he, both of those jobs, one he had for two and a half years ago, now he's been in for uh, about a year. Mm -hmm. um, they um, do the IQ test. It's not, it's not illegal uh, to do that. Um, some companies do MMPI, you know what MMPI is? Minnesota not Multiphasic Psychological Inventory. It's to see if you're crazy. Okay? <laughs> it's a, no, it's a, <laughs> but some, uh, less companies are doing it now. They used to be a lot of them. Because they don't want a crazy person coming and shooting. <laughs> uh, so again, talking about yourself, uh, they'll ask you, tell me about yourself, you know, problem-solving skills that you have, uh, challenges you overcome, uh, create, uh, creativity, and um, accomplishments that you've had. In the um, again, these are the, the typical, uh, what's your biggest weakness? And again, I explained here that. Um, what is something that you had trouble with, and how did you overcome it? Uh, one, of, uh, one of my students at Berkeley, I was teaching an HR class at Berkeley, um, um, had trouble presenting in front of the group. So she actually joined Toastmasters and did really well. And so, so she said, this is my weakness was, and I realized it right away is presenting in front of the group. So I joined Toastmasters and really helped me. So that was a good way to answer that particular question. Uh, overcoming a handicap. Um, some people read all these answers to all these questions in interviews, and then they sound like a robot. Oh, my best job was really and then I repeat. Um, and again, don't forget about the numbers, uh, uh, the data, uh, why you're interested in a particular position or world. Again, if you can't answer this question, why are you there? Right? You can't say. Um, why are you interested in this job? Oh, I want the money. Not a good answer. That's about you, not about them, right? Um, why do you hear these people? Especially, I, I hear them at Harvard all the time. I hear them on PBS. Um, oh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. It gives you time to think. Yeah, it gives you a question. A lot of people. But sometimes it is a good question. But I think it's kind of overused because. Uh, who does that? Oh, Elizabeth Warren does that. She, she wants to take time to think about um, <laughs> Body language. Again, I give you some clues here how to follow. Um, technical interview we just talked about um, at Google, for example, uh, the Excel spreadsheet. Um, ask uh, when you're applying for the position, ask them what the steps are in the selection process. Talk to HR. They'll tell you what the steps are in the process. Um, they'll tell you there's IQ test first, there's a technical test second, uh, the third step is interviewing with the manager, the fourth is with the team, the fifth is with the supervisor. Practice the interviews is really helpful. 
um, asking questions. Again, they say, you have any questions? No, that's not a good one. If they ask you, do you have questions, you better have done your homework. Oh, I read in the New York Times about your company's planning uh, to open up um, another factory in Monterey, Mexico, and um, they're going to uh, be meeting bilingual people to work in that position. Is there any connection between the possibility here and, and being assigned there, for example? Uh, um, be careful how you use information. Oh, I see that you were you were uh, accused of not paying your taxes for ten years. <laughs> not a good thing. Yeah. Or your company is uh, uh, bankrupt. Or, uh, so why is why do you want to be in that company, right? There's actually uh, what was the company? Oh, it was a hospital. Um, this guy applied for the job and got the job, and he found out the reason the guy left the CFO position, chief financial officer, was because the company was going bankrupt and they were closing. And so he spent the next six months closing the hospital. And so that's the job that he got, but he had no idea ahead of time. He didn't do any research, and if he would have read the local newspaper, he would have seen what the situation was. So again, doing your homework is so important. Uh, what do you wear? Uh, go to their website, see what the employees look like. You can drive up to their lobby, and uh, like Facebook, for example, you can actually go to the lobby there and watch the employees go in and out. Um, um, it, uh, <laughs> what? So you mentioned the I would probably mirror them what they look like because otherwise it's kind of overdoing it. Okay. Um, you guys know who Thomas Edison yeah. is. He did not invent the light bulb. Yeah. He bought it from a man from Scotland. Yeah. Um, but it was very interesting. Whenever he had a job interview, he would invite the person to sit down and the lady uh, would bring out his wife and put a big pot of soup and salt and pepper shake. And he would sit down with the person and he would watch, did that person put the salt on the soup before he tasted it? If they did, they wouldn't hire him. Why would you put salt in the soup if you hadn't tasted it? Maybe it's already salted. So, he, so he's very famous for this interview. And he did not hire anybody. Um, you know, Tesla actually Tesla, worked for yeah, him. Tesla. And Tesla did not put salt on Tesla. Tesla is a founder of Tesla. Right. Tesla is the Tesla car. Right, the, the alternating curve. Yeah. Uh, the receptionist test, I talked to you about the people when you check in, could that person could be part of the team? Uh, emotional intelligence, I mentioned this before. Again, if you take the uh, EQ or EI test, there's no good or bad result, it's just your style. And you need to be comfortable with what your style is. Emotional intelligence comes in different forms, just like different people. Uh, but just be familiar with who you are. And when there's actually a lot of um, workshops, the one I participated in Sacramento, where you actually figure out in the team what the styles of each person and how you work together with those different styles. And uh, a team that has everyone with the same style does not do well. Diversity is so important. The more diversity you have, um, as long as it's not chaos, right? Um, but the more diversity you have, the more creativity you get because you get more perspective. Um, these are some people that, that actually uh, walk out to, to, who was that? Bill Gates. Actually walked with the person out to their car to see what did, what did he want to know about their car? That's right. He didn't care what age the car was or if it was dirty. Well, it was dirty. He'd look inside the car and see how organized it was. <laughs> Print five copies of your resume when you take them. And I, I think we're pretty much done. Right? I, I, I went over time here, so I didn't want to.